this is a tough business oh, to yeah. run for oh, president. Oh, I know. You're a tough guy, Jeb. And, it's, and we need to have a leader that is <laughs> real tough. I will take it to Hillary Clinton, and I will whoop her. You're never going to be president of the United States tough, by insulting yeah. your way to well, the presidency. Well, let's see. I'm at 42, and you're at 3. So, Doesn't so matter. far, I'm doing better. Doesn't matter. Dr. Carson. Thank you, Wolf. Please join me for a moment of silence and remembrance of Jeb Bush's campaign. <laughs> I love my dad. I'd kill for him. I'd go to prison for him because I love him so much. I'll give him a warm kiss. Uh... How do you do, fellow kids? What? I was in Washington, Iowa, about three months ago, talking about how bad Washington, D.C. is. It was, to get the kind of the... Anyway. For goodness sake. A cup, All right, hello everyone, and welcome to the first Meadowcast of the the new year, the current year. It's 2016. Come on, I'm sure we're going to be hearing a lot of that shit for the next 12 months, as I've already stumbled on it just uh, just recently. I thought it was just a simple joke, but uh, meme magic, being what it is, is now spread it to the four corners of the earth, and so I look forward to a 2016 where I'm reminded every single day that is that it is in fact 2016. Uh, today we've got a couple of people coming on to pitch their their candidates. We have a Austin uh, Peterson supporter coming on first and then we'll have a Ted Cruz supporter on last. So it should be interesting uh, compared to last week. I'm, I'm still trying to get a Hillary or a Jeb supporter on. It's a little hard to find them. You gotta look under a look under a rock really especially for Jeb. You know I know he gave away his uh, famous guac recipe while he was begging for money. I, I don't understand how a man who has a $130 million war chest needs to ask for donations. He actually sent out an email to people stating, uh, you, you still have a day or two to donate. This is just at the end of the year. You still have a day or two to donate. Uh, we really need to do this for Dad. You know, One day I'm going to do a, a video on Jeb Bush because I think you really need to understand how depressing his situation is. In fact, I'm going to speculate and say he's not going to live past March. I really have a feeling, based on the interviews I've read, where they talk about people that are associates and uh, quote-unquote friends of his, how sad and miserable he really is, and how desperate he is for his father's uh, attention, which he apparently never receives. So that'll be uh, something to look forward to. I wanted to talk a little bit of shop here before we get into the actual Austin Peterson uh, supporter about kind of the general direction of the show. There's, there seems to be a little bit of confusion, so I just wanted to kind of clear this up. Uh, Meadowcast is, at its core, average, everyday people talking. This isn't a political expert. You know, these aren't erudite people that are going to come on and fedora tip their way around case law and talk about political platforms and the intricacies of it. It's just your average person coming on. The, almost the lowest information voter, if you really think about it. But it, it's the average person coming on and just talking about why they like their candidate. That, that's really all it is. I could get people who are experts on everything they want to talk about, but that, that's not what this is geared to. It's just real, normal, everyday talk. The kind of person that you would interact with around the Thanksgiving Day table. That, that is what it is trying to be, and that's kind of what I'm shooting for. I've had people say, why don't you bring on, you know, insert the name of any any well-known YouTuber, or why don't you bring on this individual, or somebody with a large following. Again, this isn't meant to network or to try to bring in large people. It's just, it's open to anybody. Absolutely anybody can come on. They can talk about a candidate they like or don't like. And there, there's no um, there's no qualifier. There's no set. You don't have to have a thousand subscribers. You don't have to even be known. You could be using an egg account. It doesn't matter to me. I just want real people to come on and talk about their candidate and try to sway us like you would another person you're talking to on the street. That's what's interesting. 
I want to know what actual voters think, and I want them to be able to explain their positions, be they informed or not informed. Now, last week, uh, we had Kyle come on to condemn a candidate, and if you stuck around to the end of the uh, Meadowcast, what you would have heard was a discussion about drug law. It, it went past him talking about Trump, and we talked for about a half an hour on drug law. Now, he had stated that he believed that the majority of drug users are not using it recreationally, that they are in fact using it for medicinal purposes. And I have something that's completely unscientific. This is not, um, <laughs> this is as unscientific as you can get, but somebody had put a poll up in the comments after the stream had finished, and I want to read the results to you because I think it, uh, I think it's entertaining, at least from my perspective. Uh, I'll put a link to it too later on if you actually want to go look at the poll yourself. But it is, what is the primary reason that causes people to do recreational drugs? Now, with 45 votes, we have medical reasons. So 45 people stated in this poll, they believe medical reasons are the primary usage of recreational drugs. At 162 votes, other is listed. Now, I don't know what other is. Maybe it's work-related. Maybe they have to drop acid at work. I have no clue. Could be anything. That's what other is. That's 162 people. What is the primary reason that causes people to use recreational drugs? And finishing it out, the last result. You know, take take a moment, take a wild guess as to what you think that number is going to be, because it comes in at a whopping 93 percent, or 2,701 votes to get high. Now, again, this is a completely unscientific poll. But there is a bit of a gulf between those two numbers. You have medical reasons at 45 votes and to get high at 2,701 votes. So, Kyle, I don't know if that's acceptable to you, but that's just a basic, uh, a basic questioning of the people that watch the Meadowcast and on what they would believe the primary reason for drug use is or people who actually use drugs. I don't know. That wasn't um, a caveat in the poll itself, but there's some numbers for you. You've got 2,900 votes, and that's how the... Uh, the numbers broke down. Now, one of the final things I wanted to talk about kind of going forward, um, while I'm interviewing these people, while I'm talking to them, whether they're pitching a candidate or even condemning a candidate, uh, I want to try to ask the questions I'd be interested in that I think most people would have an interest in hearing them answer. Now, I'm not always going to ask the questions you want to hear, and so I want to give you an opportunity to at least try to ask them something. Now, I, I tell you to go to Ask FM, but Ask FM changed its um, terms of service and has basically destroyed what the, the social media platform that it was was about. You can't really be anonymous anymore on Ask FM. You can't really have privacy. They'll take down answers now for being offensive. And so it's, it's useless for my purpose. So if you have a question while these segments are going on, I'm going to try to give at least 10 minutes near the end to ask something you might be interested in from the person that's speaking. Maybe you're more eloquent than I am. Maybe you have a better question about a policy they bring up. Or maybe you want to call me or them out. I don't know. So you can go on Twitter, and you can simply do hashtag Metocast, M-E-T-O-C-A-S-T. We will be completely alone in that. Nobody else is going to use that hashtag. It has no purpose outside of this. It is our own little thing. So if you have a question or a concern and you want, to bring, you want me to bring it up to the person pitching or condemning, that's how you can do it. So I'm, I'm trying to give you an, an avenue uh, going forward. Also, as a reminder, next week's Meadowcast isn't going to have anybody coming on for pitch or condemn. It's open to everybody. I'll have a system set up mid-time this week, but anybody can come on. You'll get 10 to 15 minutes, and you can bring up any political subject you want. Uh, if it's outside of politics, it better be really damn interesting because otherwise it's just not going to fly. And if you're more, you know, if it's something really in-depth or entertaining or, you know, extraordinarily interesting... We'll give you more time, but uh, that's going to be on the 9th. That's the next episode on Saturday coming up, and so I'll have the uh, system in place if you want to come on. You can say whatever you like, and we'll talk about it going from there. Now, I'm going to try to bring in the um, Austin Peterson supporter, and we'll see, how that, uh, we'll see how that goes going forward here. Give me one moment while I message them. I told them I'd give them a, a slight heads up that I'm going to be bringing them in, so we'll get that started. While I'm giving them that uh, minor heads up here, I see uh, people in the chat are saying, YouTube chat is fantastic. It always is fantastic. 
it also goes by a little too fast. So if you have a great question, I'm never going to catch it. That's just the reality of it. Okay, it looks like uh, they're ready to go here. Give me one second, I'll pull them in. Hey. Okay, hey, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. <clears throat> okay, fantastic. We're on right now, so just, just so you know, so you don't say anything you yeah, don't want to I say. Was, I was watching the stream. Oh, fantastic. Um, so how do you want me to refer to you? What uh, what should I call you while we're doing this? You could just call me Chris. Okay, Chris. Well, if you've seen the previous uh, couple of episodes, you kind of know how this starts out. Um, why don't you tell us, uh, the, the viewers and myself, who you're pitching for and kind of why you think we should be interested in them and why we should right. vote for them? Right. Well, obviously, I was reading the, the chat and not a lot of people even know who the guy is. He's a Libertarian Party candidate, so he's third party, not Republican or Democrat. Um, he's, uh, he runs a website, uh, Libertarian Republic. Um, yeah, he's the owner of it, not the editor in chief anymore, but, uh, founder of that website. He was, um, he was executive producer for, uh, Andrew Napolitano's Freedom Watch on Fox News for a while. And, uh, now he's running for, uh, Libertarian Party's nomination. And, um, he's, uh, it says under his, uh, his campaign's website under the, uh, the about section, you know, he's, uh, just basically a constitutional libertarian believes in economic freedom, personal liberty. Um, you know, he's, he's got a passion for limited government, um, worked at the Atlas research foundation. So you could kind of get a, uh, get a good idea of who he is from that. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I think it's an interesting contrast. You said this is the Libertarian Party candidate, correct? Yes. Because uh, we had last week, um, we had somebody come on to pitch Rand Paul. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and he and his father, Ron, are kind of seen as uh, almost, I'd say, chameleon Republicans. You know what I mean? Uh, I, I see a lot of Libertarians, at the very least, talk favorably of them. So I think it'll be kind of a good mm -hmm. uh, comparison between what his you know, stances are, what his uh, political policies and planks are, compared to somebody like a Rand Paul. It kind of gives a good contrast to see what is the difference between somebody running under the Republican Party and somebody running under the Libertarian Party. So yeah. uh, what what would you like to start this off with? Um, what what subject do you think is the most appealing that he has to voters? Is it taxes, security, freedom? What would it be? Okay, well, um, he actually has a really nice platform section on his website, and I kind of just wanted to go through that point by point. If we've got time, there's 10 points. Um, if that's too much, I can try to shorten it somehow, uh, leave out the questions, you know, kind of, we could kind of pick and choose which questions you want to go through, or we can just try to go through each point quickly. Uh, well, this, this is your time. So if, if you want to, if you want to do that, I'm, I'm more than willing to do it. So, uh, why don't you start us off with point number one and we'll go from there. Okay. So first point, is there any way you could like reduce your echo? Cause I'm hearing myself a little bit on your end. Uh, I'm I'm not sure if I could do that. I'm sorry. I I, okay. I I have this running through Skype, so it's a little a little wonky. All right, no problem. Okay, so point number one is taxes and spending, and the plan is to reduce economic inequality by lowering barriers to entry in the marketplace, licensing taxation and fees and fees. <clears throat> Urge Congress to adopt the Penny Plan, across the board spending cuts of one percent per program. Abolish the existing complicated tax code that discriminates against the most productive Americans and replace it with a simple flat tax at the lowest rate necessary to support the core functions of government. Seek voluntary ways to fund public services where possible, lotteries, tolls, etc. Okay, so we have a few things. Now, um, you said the penny, or the penny policy, right, where it's a 1% cut yeah. to every government program you can think of. Um, mm -hmm. Does he go into depth, or do you know any information about that? I mean, how, how does yeah. he plan on implementing that? Are we going to be firing people, or are we going to be shrinking <laughs> what the responsibilities of those different um, departments would be? How would he? How, how would that be enacted? What would be the mechanism by which that would work? Okay, so you have to realize, um, like, say there's a program that's costing, I don't know, $100 billion a year. Um, and basically, essentially what the penny plan would do is it would, it would say – is this program essential? And if it is, okay, let's let's cut it. Now, if it's if, if it's not essential, let's cut it. Now, if it is an essential program, we'd look at a different one that's not so essential that we cut two percent from. But say this is this is a non-essential program, you cut one one billion dollars from that program, and what essentially that would do is, you know, it would like 
one billion dollars from the budget gone and now that program only has you know 99 billion dollars to to run on so i guess the people managing that program would have more of a say on where that goes but you know wh where to whether to fire people whether to just not function as many days what have you but moving on from that well wait i i wanted to um just touch on okay. a few things um yeah. oh, okay so the implementation is it goes down the line. So let's say we have a, an essential program at 1%, but we don't want to cut anything from that, so we go to 2% to the next. Yeah. Um, and, and then you talked about budgets as well. Uh, let's say this government service or this department uh, has a budget cut. So does he, as part of his plan then, have something in place where budgets are handled differently? I mean, the money is sort of assigned uh, right. depending yeah, on the there's, agency. There's there's plenty of different um, different parts of the, his platform where he talks about the different programs he talk uh you know he'd, he'd cut you know just plenty of different things so um for example uh you know another part of his platform is you know we're, we're, we're restoring health freedom and obamacare takes a lot of money to to run to implement the the website you know he had to spend a ton of money to to do that so for example that would be something he would he would cut you know, then that would be a way we could save money. Is that does that answer your question, or uh, did you uh, want to be more specific? No, no, sort of. Um, we'll we'll just kind of go ahead here. So, okay. um, with the Obamacare example, I, I know the website was a a black hole of funding. It wasn't handled very well. They had a web developer. They they overpaid quite a bit, but that money is already already spent. Is he talking about the um with with just that example? Would he be talking about? I, I don't know the server cost, the the upkeep cost of the actual website right. itself, or is he like, talking? Okay, well, the, well, for for Obamacare, um, I, I he'd ideally want to get rid of that, but for now, we want to. The primary purpose of the penny plan, what I was getting to, was that we want to get rid of all of this stuff. We want to get rid of a lot of it anyway, like a lot of this non-essential junk. But in order to do that, like I feel like the last guy who came on didn't really answer your question on. You know, um, how are we going to do this in a way that doesn't wreck the deficit? And we have to do it slowly. We have to uh, make it so that we don't screw up our budget in the process because you can't say you're fiscally responsible and leave us with a ton of debt, right? Um, so the pu purpose of this is to do it to a point where we can actually have a balanced budget and not get rid of all of it at once and then you know, have a mess. So he's talking about a gradual phase in. Uh, did, did he yeah. list anything as in the order he'd like to start? I mean, if you go and tell people we're going to cut 1% from each program. And it's each across the board. It's across the board spending cuts. Uh, okay. But uh, how does he make that appeal or how is he pitching that to say something like social security? You're going to have a lot of people at retirement right. age that are worried social now their, their check is 1% less than it was before, which may not sound like a big deal, but for somebody who's elderly and relies on that money, it could be. Here's, here's the thing. Social security, um, is is something that people have actually worked into it's something that people um and this is another pl plank in his platform i could actually transition to this if you want yeah go ahead um, social security the, i do feel like there there are a lot of people that have a you know have a stake in it but a lot of younger libertarians view social security as kind of a ponzi scheme where you pay into it that we look like we're going to pay into it our whole lives and we're probably not going to get anything once we're 80 or 90 and actually need it. Um, now, this is plank number eight, reforming entitlements. He wants to allow young people to opt out of Social Security, where you get your check, you get the money that you would normally have paid into Social Security, and you can put it in a 401k, you can spend it, you can save it, do whatever you want with it. So that is a way that we can reduce Social Security spending right there. Okay. Uh, well, let me bring up two points in regards to that. And again, I don't know the the most information about the social security system. I'm just going on what the average person would. Um, when you're talking about you're allowing, uh, so is a libertarian party? Is it a party comprised mostly of young people? Because with with a, a lot of a lot of young people are yeah libertarians. I'd say that's fair. Oh, okay. Because with a with a kind of a point like that, you said that was point number eight for him. Yes. Uh, with point number eight. Uh, if you're talking to somebody who, again, is on Social Security, um, that obviously isn't going to appeal to them. They've already paid into the system. But I, I think another concern that would be raised for them, at the very least, is let's say the 1% cut wasn't as detrimental, or let's say that it was passed on to another program. But now you have people at the beginning of Social Security where they're paying into the system. Instead, they're not paying anymore. They're getting it to invest in a 401k or somewhere else. 
-hmm. So that that's taking money out of the program that's not going to go in checks to the people who already paid in for the last 30 or 40 well, years. How, how is he going to yeah, the, the, honor the debt or how is he going to honor the promise from the government that the people who paid into Social Security are still going to receive the benefits they're entitled to? Well, you, you do realize I've said prior to this that we are cutting other programs and that Social Security, I do believe, he would make an attempt to to prioritize money to that for the people that do still choose to to do it. Now, you're making the assumption also that everyone's going to want to opt out of Social Security. You know, um, the the problem with the baby boomers well, is that they I, had... I, it. Wait, uh, I, I would okay. say it's a fair point, though, to raise that if you tell somebody this is less money that you have to pay to the government for whatever reason. I think mm -hmm. that, I, I think it would be reasonable to assume that the majority of people would choose that, that they would say, if, I want if, to invest the money myself rather than have the government do it. Well, I mean, it, you, you, can, uh, you can make that assumption. I'm not for sure that, you know, it's, it's how true it is. I'm sure there's a lot of liberals or socialists or leftists that would pay into Social Security that says, hey, this is something that I believe the government can handle. But just, let's, let's say that everyone does want to want to drop out and, and just not pay to Social Security anymore. Well, if anything, the money should have been handled better in the first place. If you, the, the idea behind Social Security is that you pay in money and at the end of your life, you get that money back. Now, the problem that happened with the baby boomers is that they had too many kids. They had too many kids, and, uh, you know, there used to be uh, something like, I don't know, it was 12, retire or 12 uh, new people for uh, young people for every retiree, and now it's something like four or five. It's not very many, you know? So it, it, was, it was a system that wasn't designed well initially. Now, well, the whole... I, I, one one yeah. thing in response to that, I mean... America is currently at what you would call a sub-fertility rate. I mean, we're below mm -hmm. the 2.1 kids per family exactly. that would need to be sustained. However, right. that, that's a more, I, I guess, that's a more modern trend. Um, that, that's something mm -hmm. that, the kind of, uh, that occurred, I'd say, more recently. I agree. Uh, th this is where you got the idea from, you know, of the nuclear family, the, the house, the wife, the uh, pets, and the 2.3 kids. There's a reason they said 2.3, because it's above the sub-fertility rate. Um, mm -hmm. However, though, again, just as an average person, and I'm nowhere near retirement age, so Social Security right. to me isn't probably going to be paying me anything. Exactly. But, but I do feel, or I would feel bad, I, I have to say, I would feel somewhat bad for the people that did believe um, that they were going to get this money back or for the people yeah. that, that did pay into it. So I, I see it as a concern they would raise when kind exactly. of hearing, hearing this platform. Uh, now, yeah. you said that you feel he would try to keep it going at least to honor the debt to those people. Exactly. Yeah, okay. I don't believe he'd, he'd just get it, rid of it. And there are other ways, like I'm, I'm talking about here, and I was, we can get into, if you want, that we could shift some money around so their, their debts that they paid into. Because again, this was supposed to be something that you paid your money into and you got that money back later. Um, and, and we should approach it, you know, I, I feel, and I think Austin would too, um, that we should approach it from that methodology where, you know, we should have your money pay for you later. And what we did instead was we took the money because uh, the government generally doesn't handle money very well and paid for other things. So we need to change the way that, way that is done. No, and I would agree with you. I find that government bureaucracy on the whole is usually, um, you know, very slow to act. Uh, it misspends its money. It doesn't manage it very well. You know, that, there's no argument for me on that point. And so that's why he thinks that giving it back to the people and letting them um, invest it privately is smarter because then they're managing it. They get to choose where it goes. It's not going to get taken from them and spent on another program, kind of like dipping into Social Security as we've seen. Yeah. Okay. All right. That makes sense. Um, so what did you want to transition to from this, I guess? What, okay. What would be so the next point? Next next point. Um, <clears throat> let's see. National defense and military. Uh Strengthen national security by reducing slash ending foreign aid to nations hostile to the USA. Reconsider overseas, tro overseas troop deployments in areas not important to U.S. national security and audit the Pentagon. Reform the, the Veterans Affairs Administration. Oh, okay. So he wants to... Now, we heard this kind of from the um, Rand Paul yeah. supporter where he was talking about, mm -hmm. well, we don't want to get involved in foreign politics. What does um, what is Peterson? How does he differentiate between something that is essential to the United States uh, to get involved in and something that isn't? What would we be still involved in? Where would we still have troops, and where wouldn't we? Well, Austin has said on his Facebook page, um, "This is this is something I don't believe that Anton brought up last week." 
Um, he does believe that ISIS is a problem and that it needs to be dealt with in some way. And he believes that we need to get our allies involved in order to do it. You know, um, we need to work together with, with places like France and, and whatnot. But, uh, you know, something like something like Iraq or something like, you know, we've got a lot of troops going into Somalia right now. Uh, I have a friend in the army that's told me this. Um, we can probably confirm that in some way. There's a lot of troops going to places like Germany, for example. Germany's a good ally of ours that we don't let them have a military. So uh, Japan, this is probably somewhere we don't need to go. But another, another, uh, another. The, the first thing that's that said this is strengthen national security by ending foreign aid to nations hostile to the USA, and that means we don't have these big weapons shipments that go over there. Uh, to places that don't have a reliable military and then get stolen by ISIS or whoever else like that or you know nations that generally have a anti-US sentiment we, why are we sending money to these places so these are generally areas that Austin would try to reform oh okay a few things in relation to that um, so mm -hmm. he would pull out troops from say a Somalia or maybe a, a Japan something like that would he keep them at the DMZ would we still have troops between South and North Korea or would he feel the South Koreans could manage that on their own, that it's been long enough that they can handle that? Um, he would probably listen to his generals on the, the DMZ thing. Uh, I mean, I, I again, I'm not, I'm going to be honest with you straight up. I don't know a ton about the, the Korean border. I've heard that there's a lot of, um, the, the South Koreans are very scared that the North Koreans might, um, might, you know, attack or something and they'll get overwhelmed by that because the North Korea has a lot of weaponry. Um, but I think what he's primary, primarily saying is that we have to balance, there needs to be a balance of who we send money to um, and why. Now, South Korea is our ally and we let them have a military. So it probably doesn't cost us as much as running their entire military like we do for Germany and Japan, or at least most of it. So I would say that He'd be reason he'd be okay with helping them defend their borders since they're a U.S. ally and we trade with them and they have benefits for it. You know, we get technology from them, what have you. But he wouldn't want to like run their military or uh, intervene and tell them like how to use it. I don't. I think that's mostly what he's trying to say here. Oh, okay. The the only reason I bring up um, the South and North Korean. Uh, example is because some people would see it as a proxy war with North Korea supported by China and the United right. States supporting um, South Korea. Uh, in, in relation to giving foreign aid to different countries that are hostile or misusing it or, you know, funding weapons and terrorism and things like that, Yeah. Um, that, you know, to me that makes sense. However, how does he see foreign relations with, com or with companies, with countries that do that on their own? Look at Saudi Arabia, look at Israel, look at nations like this that have had accusations that they are somehow facilitating or funding terrorism or groups that are hostile to the United States. Does he see a renegotiation of our interactions with them or are we still allies? Do we still have good relations? How does he manage that? I want to, he's a constitutionalist, like I said, and he believes in the what the founders say, um, have said and likes to base a lot of what he does off of what they said. So George Washington, I believe it was, says we should have an honest friendship with all nations, but entangling alliances with none. So essentially something like someone like uh, Saudi Arabia or someone that, you know, is suspected of harboring, you know, what, what have you, terrorist groups, uh, rebel groups, whatever you want to say, um, trade with them, do business with them, but generally distance yourself from those countries. You know, I would say that's probably what, what the, the, the foreign policy plan. Right. Yeah. The foreign policy plan almost sounds like a Ferengi. Like we'll, we'll do business yeah. with anybody, but we're not going to go to war for you is kind of essentially what it is. Exactly. Okay. Um, what, uh, let's just, uh, again, we'll walk point by point through the, uh, the platform. What's, uh, what's your next point? Next point, free trade, lower barriers to trade with foreign nations and allow American companies the leeway they need to develop domestic energy production in order to create good paying jobs at home. Okay. Can you go into a little bit of depth or does he expand on that? What? Uh... Right, right now, um, there are a ton of huge entangling um, uh, trade alliances, the TPP, 
uh, lots of lots of big uh, you know embargoes, uh, imports, import tariffs, uh, a lot of big barriers that companies want to do or that companies have to get over in order to do business uh, with with countries or companies in other countries. So he wants to allow the U.S. to do business with those companies or those countries in a way that doesn't raise prices. And he wants to allow, uh, you know, the companies to make energy here instead of, you know, having to go to another country in order to, uh, you know, make that, you know, oil. You see what I'm saying? Well, it sounds like we're talking yeah, about energy. Um... It sounds like we're talking about two things, so I'll try to address each. Um, so is he talking about a restructuring of uh, our favored nation policy when it comes to trade? Is he talking about uh, renegotiating or doing away with or maybe reforming something like the North American Free Trade Agreement or the Trans-Pacific Partnership? Uh, how does he see that um, playing out exactly? Does he want to get rid of them, renegotiate them, or restructure them? Well, you have to realize how much the president can do here. Um, I would, I would guess that he would... Uh, look through these because a lot of them they're just 600 pages long a lot of these aren't aren't widely available to the public so um, you you have to in specific to like the trans-pacific partnership there's there's probably good and bad in there um, so I would say probably renegotiate it before you just hastily get rid of these these uh, deals well from what I know about the TPP it's uh, I believe one part of legislation or it's one agreement uh, mm. Amongst three, that that exactly. is supposed to set up a trade system worldwide. Uh, now, the other point I, I guess I would get to, in kind of a relation to this, when you're talking about uh, tariffs, when you're talking about taxes, and opening up freer trade with other countries, you say that you want to make it cheaper for companies to produce here rather than going over there. But if you're removing mm. import tariffs, if you're if you're restructuring taxes and the tolls that people are paying, wouldn't that make it more attractive for a company to go outside the U.S. because they're not getting hit than re-importing whatever it is they make? I know that's outside of energy, but wait, you want you think that companies will leave the country because there's lower taxes here? No, what I'm saying is, if you're telling me that to, are you, when you said import tariffs, are you talking about companies? Well, I'm, I'm just using that as an example. You know, there's a, there's a ton of different barriers that com companies have to go through in order if they want to trade with someone else in another another country. Right, right. But to make free trade more attractive um, with the United States, we decrease or eliminate import tariffs. So we'd make it cheaper for them to bring products over here. So what is to stop a company from saying, I want to go to India, where I can pay workers five cents an hour, make the product, and then I can ship it over to the United States. And now it's even cheaper because I'm not getting hit importing it back or exporting it back into the U.S. Well, that's that's not really that's that's you you when when you're trading overseas, you have to ship it all the way across the ocean. You have to you know wait for all this. Uh, you have to pay a ton of people to get it over here. Um, you know you have to there these things cost money so. You know, I, I'm not exactly sure why it would be more expensive to do business overseas at that point. If he's he is against the minimum wage here, so again, just go, why would you ship your company all the way across the ocean and go through all those hoops if doing business here is also pretty cheap? Well, yeah, but what I'm looking at or what I'm considering is, mm -hmm. um, you set up this new system. You know, and he, he's talking from a federal level, but you still have different state taxes. You still have different costs associated with doing business in the U.S. I don't know how much of a hindrance, um, you know, importing into the United States is. I don't know how much they're getting hit for. I mean, granted, there is, an, a, you know, a, a cost associated with shipping the materials and then shipping the product back. But in the United States itself, you, you still have to ship the products around. They're still going on a plane. They're still going on a truck. They may even be going on a boat. So I think that's yeah. already built in. Granted, it would be more, but it's not unheard of. It's not like they have to create a new system, uh, you know, a new logistics system to handle it. I mean, it's something they're already familiar with and they already have in place. That, And again, that's why I bring that up. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Okay, uh, what would your next point be? Next point, audit, okay, monetary policy. Audit the Federal Reserve Institute, a monetary commission devoted to studying the implications of replacing central banking with free banking and abolish laws of legal tender. Okay. Well, the first two I've heard before, or the first I, I've heard brought up before, you know, audit the Fed, uh, look into what's been going on, look into replacing the system that exists. Uh, when you say abolishing, you said legal tender, what, what does he mean by that? 
Okay, so right now when you go to work, you have to get paid in dollars so the U.S. government can tax you, you know. Um, and what he essentially wants to do is, and, you know, generally companies do businesses in dollars. Dem generally, um, you know, that's it's fiat money. So he wants to be give people the freedom to do business with commodities, barter, you know, do whatever you want in terms of, how you use money. So you can pay people in silver certificates, you can pay people in Bitcoin, you can pay people whatever kind of money that you want and allow people to trade uh, if they don't have faith in the dollar the ways that they choose to. Okay. Um, I think a few things related to that just off the top of my head. And again, I'm not the most informed person, so you'll have to bear with me. Uh, when we're talking about debt owned by foreign nations, uh, you know, that's calculated through the dollar and the strength of the dollar. You institute a non-fiat currency, um, you go to the gold standard, you go to just commodity trading well, or something else. Yeah. Uh, how, how is that going to impact another country getting our debt back? If they see us making a move from fiat currency and a dollar, which is relatively stable, into some new, completely new system, what's well, going to... Wait, 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 say... wait, wait, wait one sec. What's going to stop them from saying, okay, America's gone crazy, we need to get our money back and we need to get it back now because we have no idea what the implications of them switching systems is. So what if China comes calling? What if uh, a European country comes calling and says, we want trillions of dollars right now, you owe it to us, uh, we are coming to collect? Okay, here's the thing. I don't think the dollar is stable. I mean, I don't really think that's a fair argument to make. The dollar uh, well, I would say is that not it's... really backed by anything. Uh, okay, but I would make the argument that if you went to somebody just today and yeah. said, I can pay you in dollars or promissory notes signed by myself, they're probably going to want to go with the dollar. Promissory notes instead of that, like you said you a no, said, you said a barter system that you can you can pay okay, and trade and anything you want. What I said was what I said was silver certificates, and what that essentially is is that I have silver uh, payable to you at any time you want to get that. Yeah, but I, I, that's a promissory note. Who is the silver guaranteed by? It's guaranteed by you. I only have your word, not the backing of a government. Okay, but that that was that was an example. You know, I could if I actually gave you a silver uh, dollar right now that has a melt dollar of fifteen dollars you know uh, I think most people would rather actually have that than you know a bunch of uh, paper okay, I'm, not, I'm not arguing that fiat currency I, I don't want you to misunderstand me here okay I'm not arguing that fiat currency is the best currency I, we could have a debate on finite resources and using materials as money rather than something like fiat currency that would be a separate discussion all I'm saying is when it comes time to collect on a debt or to do a trade or exchange commodities. Okay, I, so I, wait, wondering. Wait, well, yeah, I'm wondering what the security is for my position. Sure, you could give me silver, you could give me gold, and then say, see, I'm, I'm reliable. I'll give you certificates saying that it's backed. But again, from my perspective, you're not a government with an income from tax revenue. You don't have uh, land holdings. You're just a guy. So your promissory note, even if you give me cash up front, doesn't really put security in my mind like the United States government saying, we print the money, we back the money, it's reliable. You see what I'm saying? That's, that's I think, only... what a concern would be from the average person, just the average person. Okay, the average person. I mean, okay, with, with the average person, I would explain it this way. Um, so you, you do realize that uh, in the 60s, the Federal Reserve essentially took us off the sil gold and silver standard completely. That was uh, Those were the last years that we were on it. Um, and it, now it's essentially just replaced with paper. Now, what what happened throughout the bailouts was uh, they they printed just uh, hundreds upon hundreds of billions of dollars. And what happens when you do that is the the value of the dollar goes down when you just print it out of thin air. Um, now, as right? In, if, in if, the if, 19... if you flood the market with mm -hmm. more and more of something, it diminishes the value of what you already have. I yep. I got you. Go ahead. Okay, but for the average person listening, that's what I would say. Oh, oh, sorry. Now, yeah. now what? Now what happens is, um, I would say this system is actually better because if what's to stop China now or one of these countries from saying, "Hey, we want our debt back. Uh, we want, we want this and this," and the government could just print trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars to pay its debt if countries come calling. Now, um, the system would be better because if that happened, if the countries just came and said, give us our money back, the dollar, it would cause hyperinflation here and the dollar would be worthless. Now, you could well, still... Well, um, let me interject just one thing really here, uh, yeah. really quick here. 
I, I think part of the reason you don't see that happening, and again, uninformed person speaking, but I think part of the reason you don't see that happening is when you look at trade internationally with something like um, energy, with oil, usually yeah. that trade, or it used to be, I know it's shifting now somewhat, but it was dollar-backed. People traded in dollars. Dollars became yeah. the standard to do that. I the, think The world's uh, reserve currency is what you're trying to say. I'm familiar. Yep. So I think part of the reason you don't see a country coming out and saying, pay us all our money immediately right now is because they know it would have effects they know it would have a ripple mm -hmm. effect on international trade on energy trade because they're using a currency that backs that and now they're messing with it by demanding to be paid immediately yes exactly but you said what's to stop a country from doing that and i'm just go i'm just using that scenario here i'm i'm well aware of that's probably not going to happen but since you brought it up i'm trying to address that point that you you brought up there fair enough so go ahead you want me to go yeah. okay so if if the, if they did that and i'm not saying they're going to in any way but if they did that there would be hyperinflation here because when you print money that destroys the faith in it so this money at, at that point if if you have um just barrels full of money uh that you have to go just to go grocery shopping um now the, i think people would then have a little bit more faith in uh, things like Bitcoin or things like silver, things uh, sound, secure, honest money, stable money, than uh, they would with this fiat currency. So in that scenario that you brought up, I still think this would be a more preferable solution for the average person. You know, I, that's 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 my opinion on it. Is there anything else you wanted to get into with that or any other questions you had regarding it? Oh, okay. Um, let's say we're, we're dealing with um, silver or gold. What's to stop somebody from buying up all of that commodity or taking all of it that they can get their hands on? Um, how does that impact trade in the United States? How does that impact businesses and well, customers? That's interesting that you said we want uh, we want everyone. To, uh, what happens if someone already buys up all the gold or all the silver, all the commodity? That's already happening right now in the presence of this state. That ha that happens with the government. That's essentially what they what they're doing, and that's um, what they have done in the past under FDR. He actually made an executive order for everyone to uh, to surrender all their gold, all their silver, all of this um, to the Federal Reserve. And, you know, I think with this system, if with more decentralization and more uh, freedom to do with your own currency, with what, you, you know, as you please, something like that isn't actually a threat. So... How it's do, already how, happening now, so I okay, mean, okay. How would you be a better scenario? What would the regulating body be, or what would the exchange body be, if, if let's say we went to a system like this where you can back it with um, a finite resource? Who who knows what that would what form that would take? Maybe it'd be silver, gold, something else. I don't know. Who's going to set the standard for the trade between those things? I mean, you're not comparing it to. Why do you need? Why do you need a governmental body to regulate trade between two people? That should be between uh, those. No, two no, 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 no. How, how are you going to function in day to day life? If I go to Walmart, if I go to Target, and I want to buy something, and they say, "Okay, well, that'll be ten oil dollars, or that'll be uh, two gold certificates, or that'll be one silver certificate." How how the hell do I know as just an average person going out to purchase something the actual value of what I have? I have nothing to compare it to. I'm going to well, need some kind of an index. Some kind of a resource that compares each of those, so I have an idea of each each's value in relation yeah. to each other value. You see what I'm saying? Right. Well, you know, there are actually services right now that you you put the money, you have money in your bank account, right? And you you pay them. I'm not familiar. I have I have a friend that would know this service because he uses it all the time. But you have money in your bank account, and you have Bitcoin. Now you can pay the Bitcoin to the service, and they will give you dollar. You know dollars uh back to you so there are there are services that would that would trade uh you know different money for d other different kinds of money in this scenario so before you go to walmart maybe walmart you know sees that a lot of people use a lot of different currencies and it implements one of these systems so how are we not heading towards a hershey town scenario where you have private companies that are in control of what these exchange rates are or the ones that decide the value of them and give themselves the better deal and then internationally trade or trade with other companies at a better rate for themselves. And I, I guess well, the other thing with that would be, you know, when, when you're talking about a system like this, you have to understand like the day-to-day -day person, how are they going to cope with that if they're dealing with 19, 20 different forms of money? I mean, you brought up Bitcoin. Bitcoin, if, I, if, if I'm right on this, wasn't that created by a Japanese man? I mean, we're talking about something that's not a resource, something I can't take out of the earth, something just created by a foreigner. 
So, I mean, where's the sense of security as to the value of it if we were to use something like a Bitcoin compared to a silver certificate or a gold certificate? So you're you're just asking about Bitcoin in particular instead of a silver certificate or a gold certificate. If I'm understanding this, the question is just directed at Bitcoin. Well, it's two parts. Okay, yeah, the okay. Second, I'll answer the, the first part with the Hershey Town scenario. Okay, go ahead. So essentially what you already have right now is companies getting the best deal for themselves with other companies. You know, you, you have a, a company that, I don't know, that makes paper products and it sells it to, I don't know, Office Depot. Off, when, when that company sells their, their uh, paper product to Office Depot or just any, any kind of commodity that they make, they're selling it at a, small, at a lower rate than Office Depot would sell it to the consumers. So that system that you're describing is already here. Now, but I would well, say this... you, you're talking about wholesale price versus real t or retail price, correct? Yeah. Yeah, but no, what I'm saying is with the Hershey Town scenario, you've got companies, right, that now mm -hmm. aren't just dictating the price, but the value of the money paid for that price. That's yeah. It's it's a but it's a twofer. They're double dipping now. So what's the start? Why shouldn't companies what... determine the value of what they what they get back? They're not just determining. Well, they're not just determining the value of the product on the market they're determining the value of the currency used to purchase that product you don't think yeah. that's dangerous you don't think that you're giving too much power to a corporation or a third party to screw with the system to work it to their advantage well, there's no more regulation there's no more government body that exists you know I, I i'm for small government i agree uh but one of the functions of a governmental body is that you're paying taxes so you have a voice you have something that can go in and say no, you're not going to screw with the value of silver or gold or Bitcoin. You have to play fair. But now that system isn't in place anymore. Now a company or conglomerate that's massive <clears throat> and rich can say, well, you know what? Not only does our product cost this much, but we're only going to exchange it at this value because we have devalued. We have okay. chosen the value I, okay, of I the currency. I see what you're saying. I see yep. what you're saying. Um, you have to realize the economics of, of what you're saying. Um, with... with uh, supply versus demand that there's there are five determinants of supply generally when you when you have to uh you have to deal with uh suppliers giving their product to to consumers and one of these one of these determinants is the number of sellers and more sellers raise production uh etc now since there are more sellers here uh some of them if they saw that other companies were were giving bad deals with um with uh you know if they're giving bad deals to their consumers other companies would generally uh try to compete with that try to make their goods more attractive and consumers would notice that there is a better deal and and go to that that company instead of you know give it, going giving their business to someone who's overcharging them well i understand the power of a consumer but uh, we can't you know ignore the history of the united states we could find yeah. ourselves back in a position of the robber barons. We could find ourselves back in a position where you've got massive conglomerates and monopolies that work together to work a system. So I, I, I yeah. think that that's one of my, my fears. We'll, we'll move you, on from you, the, uh, Go ahead. I'm sorry. You, you, you are, you're afraid of uh, companies ca like forming a cartel or something where they... they um... Well, they already do that in this day and age. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, companies are by yeah. their nature profit driven. That is all they care about. A company, a good company should be. All it cares about is its bottom line, getting the best deal that it can. So, you know, by its very nature, it's going to try to seek out any means to to do that. Laws and regulations are the means by which people prevent them from doing atrocious things in regards to that. When you remove regulatory bodies, when you decrease the power of government, while I do agree that's good and I think it should be looked at, you run the risk of taking the leash off a very, a very wild dog that may return to previous mentalities and ideologies such as fuck them we're going to bilk them for as much as we can we'll do it together and they won't be able to stop us we'll all profit more in the, through the, this the, cooperation in the days of the robber barons the united states government had uh had a vested interest in making sure that their companies were worldwide uh monopolies that that could um uh, that could it's essentially do what you're saying and the the people essentially gave money to their to the government in order to make sure that they stayed uh they they stayed in power these these companies could were able to do what you're saying but if you remove 
you know, if you limit the power of government more and, the, you know, you, you saw the, the companies, they, they employed the police to break up the unions, uh, the people demanding fair, fair wages. They used the, um, you know, the power of the state to enforce this. But I think what Austin wants to do is he wants to remove that state power to make sure that these these companies can't uh, can't screw over the, you know, aren't protected when they screw over the consumer. Now, you have to realize that a company can't force you to use its product. Um, well, I, I would argue that in a Hershey Town scenario, they absolutely can. Let's say that you're a low-income family and this change happens. You don't have the money mm -hmm. to move to a different location. So what if it's a regional company? What if they own all the businesses in the area? Now they say, not only do you have to trade in the currency we dictate because that's what we pay, but you're going to accept the rates at which we decide regionally as opposed to nationally. So what's to stop them from doing that? There is there's some I mean, that 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 was a problem back in the day. But we have uh, the Internet where people can easily find all sorts of different deals on a wide different market of, you know, on a wide market of, of different goods. Different oh, no, no. What, prices, what I, different. I guess I should rephrase that. I'm sorry. It's my fault. Uh, what I mean is, let's say that uh, I'm currently living in a hypothetical town. That's the name okay. of it. It's hypothetical town, United States. And in hypothetical town, United States, there are five major companies. And those five major companies decide we're going to pay out using this specific currency. And this specific okay. currency is only good in this town. Nobody else wants it because we screw with the uh, exchange rates. We just basically want to get it back. We know the All poor right. people that live in hypothetical town not only will work at our companies, but they won't be able to exchange it for other currencies. They'll Why have not? to... Why? Why wouldn't? What's to stop someone from making a company that uh, uh, that goes oh, that no, no, goes no. outside? If, okay. If you have a regional currency that's just in one town, what's going to be the attraction for some multinational corporation or for some statewide corporation to say, Wait, "Yeah, I want hypothetical town dollars." That's really important to me. What yeah, would because, be there? Because they're because the, the that company could do business with the five or six uh, ones you just mentioned before. So they'd exchange. They'd use the people to exchange money. Uh, that that local hypothetical town dollars uh, in exchange for Bitcoin or something else like that and do business with the uh, companies that you mentioned in the area. Okay. I, I think the problem you would run into, and again, this is just, just running off this premise, but I think the problem you would run into is what is the attraction for them to go out of their way to do that? They're already making money. They're already doing good business. What's, it, what's the attraction for someone to start a small business that would, uh, that would, that would, you know, exchange the hypothetical town dollars for currency that's valuable elsewhere. Yes. What's the, I, what's the attraction for that? What What's going to motivate them to do that? How are they going to facilitate that trade? Who's going to say, I want hypothetical town dollars? I can only use them. Those companies want hypothetical town dollars. Why? Why did they want hypothetical town dollars? Why yeah. did they want to make profit? The, comp oh, no, the, the five or six ones that you mentioned before would want hypothetical town dollars. Everyone in that area wants that money. They, you know, they could trade it for... Uh, for you know, they have that money, and generally, and they can trade it for other kinds of currency elsewhere if they wish to. Okay. Uh, well, I, I'd love to go. I, I'm trying to. I don't want to get us too off track. Uh, okay. Maybe, sure. maybe maybe I'll have you on next week, and we can, we can talk more about hey, this. Hey, you know depth. what? I actually wanted to ask you if um if I could come on the condemn a candidate section at some point. Maybe we could talk about this more then, because I wanted to condemn Bernie Sanders. Because believe me, I've written plenty about this stuff that he was saying. Yeah, no, that, that's fine by me. If you want to come on, uh, the ninth is going to be the viewer feedback one. So it would okay. be on the, um, God, what would it be? The 16th, you could come back on and do Condemn a Candidate. Okay, excellent, excellent. Let's do that. Okay, um, I want to check, uh, we'll, we'll go over a few more points. This, this goes so quickly once we get talking. Uh, we'll go over a few more points here and then uh, we'll wrap it up. But I told people if they had questions or if they wanted to bring something up, maybe I'm not asking the right questions, maybe they have a point I just haven't raised. So I'm going to check that really quick if you'll bear with me one second. Right. And we'll see we'll see if anybody has anything they think is relevant to anything we've discussed, any of the, the policies that have been brought up. Right. <laughs> uh, you're going to have to give me a second. Uh, just reading through. Uh, okay, let's see. Okay, no, it looks like um, I'm not seeing anything. Okay, uh, here's one from uh, Sergeant Slaughter. A digital currency can be manipulated by people with access to large servers to just mine them. Bitcoin is insanely unstable. 
uh, if we were to move towards, I guess, a digital currency, or if that was used as one of the exchanges, uh, do you see that as being an issue? Do you see that as being unstable, that people could work the system to affect the value? I mean, they could, but I believe that we should decentralize the currency so that people don't have that much power over it. Uh, in yeah. general, so people could exchange different kinds of currencies that they feel are more stable. Okay. I, I guess my problem with this, and this is just coming back to the whole point itself, it seems like a lot of work to ask the average person to deal with. You know, their job might pay them in one form, the store they like might take another form, the internet might need a different form. And how are you going to trade these multiple currencies in the United States for foreign currencies? I mean, are you going to go through some long, tedious process of changing silver into gold, into bitcoins, into oil dollars, into hypothetical dollars, just so you can go over to Germany? You know what I mean? And, and use their currency. I, it, it seems like you're, this kind of a, propo or a proposal would be putting a lot. It'd be putting a lot of onus yeah, on the American I, population. I get that, but doesn't doesn't silver pretty much have a universal value, or gold pretty much have a universal value? I, I argue to to a point, but again, that would get into the argument of a finite resource used as a backing for um, a currency. Uh, well, how about this? We'll table this. And when you come on to condemn a candidate, we'll get back into this. Okay. We'll do we'll do fifteen or twenty minutes on it, and then I'll give you forty to fifty to. Um, to talk about you said sanders sure definitely okay. all right that sounds fair um we'll do two more points and then we'll close it up so what do you think the the last two points go ahead and pick them decide what you think is most important for people to hear about um final two yeah final two what do you think is most important for somebody a potential voter who would be interested in this candidate what other two points the last two in his uh, platform would really appeal to them or be of interest to them okay so um, crime and punishment, reclassify the war on drugs as a medical problem, not a criminal problem, deschedule f drugs at federal level. Okay, so we're, we're talking about removing uh, Schedule 1, Schedule 2, Schedule 3 drugs, and I yeah. is, it, is it any regulation or is it just completely open? Um, I mean, here's, here's the thing. It's, uh, I think it's, it'd be completely open. Oh, okay, so there's no... Uh, uh, okay. <laughs> The, well, this would get us into another long uh, conversation, but mm -hmm. so is he talking about uh, just anybody? So I could brew up stuff in my basement and a company could make it in the laboratory and it's equally fair to sell it to somebody and have them ingest it. Um, yeah, if those two consenting parties agree. Okay. Um, would there be any regulations to protect them if they get injured or would we just rely on the current criminal and civil structures that exist? I mean, uh, protect them if they get injured. Um, I mean, if they get injured uh, doing drugs irresponsibly, I believe that should be their own responsibility to fix. So No, I meant um, if, well, let's say I'm cooking up bathtub gin and I, I cut it with paint okay. thinner, and then your stomach ends up, you, you start throwing up blood because you just drank paint thinner. What, right. um, what mechanism would he see? Because you're going to open up an entirely new market. So Well, that's, that's, that's a crime with a victim, so I do believe that that would be prosecuted and dealt with. Okay, so he'd use the existing civil and criminal systems to deal with it that. Would, I if if by existing criminal and, and civil systems like you know judges and courts, sure. Okay, all right. Um, and then what was your your final point? Uh, that was the deregulation of drugs, the declassifying the schedule system that they use right now to classify drugs. Yeah. What would the uh, the final point be for uh, Mr. Peterson? Uh, Immigration. Streamline our immigration system by following updated Ellis Island style protocol, security check, disease check done. Uh, okay, so what would what does he mean, I guess? Uh, again, I, I don't know what the Ellis Island protocol is or what their standards right. are. So what does he mean by that? What, is, what does so, that look like? So before, um, before the current immigration system, when someone wanted to come over to the country, instead of filing out a bunch of paperwork or whatever, they would go to Ellis Island, you know, wait for a while and... Um, you know, and come over after things were uh, sorted out with them. Now, the problem that happened today is that there were there was not a welfare state, or at least not a robust one back in the day. So people wouldn't abuse the system. They'd have to come over and find work, find family, or they wouldn't come over at all. So this system would essentially encourage people who are actually hardworking, who actually want to contribute to our economy, to come over here and uh, and contribute instead of having you know being discriminated against uh just like you know if you actually want to follow the system because now it's easier to come over here illegally and abuse the system okay so we're talking almost kind of like a um 
uh, a Heinlein model or a French Foreign Legion model. You're talking about service guarantee citizenship. If you provide a value, uh, if you're valuable, if you work, uh, if you have some amazing special skill or special trait, that's mm -hmm. how you're going to gain entrance. You can't just show up and say, hey, you know, I worked part-time at McDonald's like 10 years ago and my education's level fourth grade and I don't really have any family let me in. That That's kind of what we're talking about. Well, right. But if I think if you're willing to work hard and to save money, you should be allowed to, you know, come to this country. And I think that's what Austin would agree. OK. OK. I, I just wanted to try to get an idea. Uh, sometimes when I have people on, you know, when we've talked about immigration policies, it's a little muddled. So it's, a, it's fairly straightforward. Um, I will give you because uh, we're getting near the end of our time here. I'm going to give you the last couple of minutes um, mm. to basically. To, to tell us what you think we need to know. You're going to close it out. you got a 1,000 people watching. Tell them what you think they need to know about your candidate and why should they vote for him. Well, for, for Austin, I think it's, um, he's, it's, it's a little different than, than Rand Paul. Um, Rand Paul is uh, not as, um, he's not as, as consistent with his, uh, with his policies as Austin is, I feel. He's... Um, He's a little bit more, uh, he's, his voting record's not the best, I, I feel. Um, he hasn't really uh, stood out that much from the other candidates. He's more uh, generic than they are. So I feel Austin would be a better, uh, he'd be the best chance we have to restore freedom in this country. And, um, you know, you got his platform online, you could go check it out. Austin Peterson 2016 platform. Uh, you could go check it out there. Um, is that honestly, a uh, is that a dot com or a dot org? Um, I'll I'll link it to you on Skype if you want. Oh no, I'm, I just bring it up for the for the people it's listen, dot listening. Com. Austin dot com. Peterson 2016com slash platform. Okay, and if people wanted to get in touch with the the candidate or ask him a question, um, would they go to a gathering? Would there be a rally? Is there a social media platform he's he uses? Pretty, he's pretty uh, he's pretty active on social media. You could just search Austin Peterson on uh, on Facebook. He's got twenty two thousand likes. That's the page, and yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, Chris, thank you for coming on. Uh, again, that's Austin Peterson, the Libertarian Party candidate. Uh, you can find him at the sites that were listed. Uh, again, thank you for your time. We'll have you on uh, two weeks from now. Uh, we'll okay. pick up our, our conversation about currency and about trade, and then we'll go into the condemn candidate uh, portion. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Have a good one. You too. Okay. So that was the uh, the supporter for Austin Peterson, the Libertarian Party candidate. Uh, I'll try to post a link too, as well, to the platform and his Facebook page. Uh, I'm going to start doing that from now on because I had other people on that. It said you can reach my candidate here, or you can read about their the planks in their platform here. So if you have an interest, I'll post it later. You can go take a look at it and see what the, or what you think. I'm reading through the comments uh, again. It's uh, Meadowcast, M-E-T-O-C-A-S-T. If you have something you want to bring up, that would be the way to do it. And I had a few questions I didn't get a chance to ask. I will ask them uh, two weeks from now when he comes back on. Somebody asked uh, how uh, ask how he justifies tax cuts and incentives for the rich when there are so many people in poverty who won't benefit from them. So I'll make sure to, uh, to ask that for you. Your Fedora Man, which is a fantastic handle. That is, uh, that is great. Somebody said, Jim said, own us again, bring out the top hats. I'm pulling out those $10 words. I hope you enjoy them. Another person responding to somebody earlier on who had said, you can't destabilize the value of crypto, you fucking retards. So feel free to argue with Niggy Noggy one who believes you can't destabilize the value of cryptocurrencies, you retards. All right. Well, we'll do a, a little bit of news, uh, a few things that have happened over the last week, and then I'm going to have a Ted Cruz supporter come on. Uh, I'm not sure exactly when, sometime in the next 30 minutes to 60 minutes. We'll... Uh, talk with them and see what their candidate thinks. Uh, I can't remember if I invited him on to support Ted Cruz or to condemn another candidate. Maybe we'll do a little of both. Now, I just saw today uh, a Bernie Sanders town hall uh, where he had a bit of a confrontation regarding uh, the situation in Gaza. I was going to play the, uh, the audio of that for you and then uh, discuss it a bit. So let me just pull that up. Because uh, Bernie had a little bit of an issue with the people bringing up the question. They got a little bit raucous with him. And if we all remember the last time Bernie Sanders had people confront him when he was giving a speech, he kind of bowed his head and stood off to the side. He didn't really do that this time. So 
we'll see what uh, what happened with that. Clinic to serve the people who are there. Israel blockades, besieges, and bombs the stateless people who are cut off from the world, and we in the United States reward them with their with arms and dollars. And the Senate voted its support with resolution. 498 in the midst of this massacre just a few weeks ago. This resolution condemns only Hamas, but it says nothing about what Israel is doing. A thousand civilians have died in Gaza, three civilians have died in Israel, in sending this money to Israel and replenishing their weapons supply at the same time that they're continuing to bomb hospitals, schools, homes, and UN shelters for people whose homes have been destroyed. Now, this is, uh, as I said, Sanders at a town hall. This is a while ago. It's interesting to contrast this from, um, God, this would be two years ago. I keep wanting to say it's still 2015. It's not. But this is uh, Sanders responding to somebody bringing up the Gaza situation, Israel and Palestine. And you can hear his reaction. So it, it makes it a little bit interesting to see how he'd react now that he's on the campaign trail full time if somebody were to bring up something similar or uh, raise these points. So I'll try to cue it up here. You have a situation where Hamas is sending missiles into Israel. Look that. And you know where some of those missiles are coming from? They're coming from population, populated areas. That's a fact. Hamas has used money that came into Gaza for construction purposes, and God knows they need roads and all the things that they need, and use some of that money to build these very sophisticated tunnels into Israel for military purposes. For survival purposes. Okay, well, one second. Yes, now, I don't want to be interrupted. The question was asked. It's a fair question. And the I'm trying to... The the war, okay, so the yeah, has the right to look, resist. if you don't... Yes, they did. You know, is, I, excuse me. Again. Shut up. What you do don't you? have the microphone. You've you asked... You know, I don't want police officers here. You're going to arrest people? No, I'm not going to arrest people. But are you going to allow us? Are you going to allow us to have a discussion? What do you think? You come down here. You're up there. Come down to be Democrat. So have a discussion with people. Are you asking for the point? Occupy Palestine. 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 All right. I would find All right, I am answering a question, and I do not want to be disturbed and disrupted. Right? I'm not the only person here. I'm happy to ask a reasonable question, and I'm trying to answer it, and I don't want to be disrupted. All right? In my view, you're entitled to your view, I am entitled to my view. In my view, Hamas has done those things, and on top of that, Hamas is very clear. They want, their view is that Israel should not have a right to exist. That's the fact. Bullshit! Hey, you know what? It's not a dirty word! It's not just a terrorist group. 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 It's not just a terrorist Ask the question, then please don't come to me. All right, furthermore, the is issue of Gaza is not the only issue right now in that region. As some of you may have noticed, there's a group called ISIS. You know what ISIS is? Yeah. ISIS is Excuse me. ISIS is a group receiving money from around the world that wants to convert parts of Iraq and Syria into a 7th century caliphate. You know what women's rights are in that area? They're below... Excuse me, let him talk. They are... If nobody wants to listen, they can read. So you have a situation right now where we are figuring out in that region how you deal with people who have tens of thousands of very armed and aggressive people who may be making significant gains in that area. 
So the point that I'm making is, yeah, I share your concerns about Israeli corporate action. I was not one of the people who signed on for that resolution. But the issue is broader. I believe in a two-state solution. I would hope that the United States, in a very, very difficult situation where the leadership on both sides is not particularly good, can finally work out a situation where Israel has the right to exist in security. At the same time, the Palestinians have a state of their own. And that's what I would like to see. Okay? I've been working on it for the last 50 years. I'm sorry, I don't have the magic answer. This is a very depressing and difficult issue. This has gone on for 60 bloody years. Year after year, war walked up. If you're asking me, do I have a magical solution? I don't. Well, there you go. Bernie Sanders does not have, as he stated, the magical solution for peace in the Middle East. I think the clip is interesting for two reasons, though. Uh, one, at this uh, town hall event in 2014. It was August 17th, 2014 is when the video went up. If you're interested, you can watch the full thing. It's called Bernie Sanders Town Hall Gives U.S. Party Line When Confronted Regarding Hashtag Gaza. It's up on YouTube on Marie Countryman's YouTube page. But it, it's interesting for two reasons. Uh, when he addresses ISIS, he talks about the threat they pose, tens of thousands of people, international support that's funding them. Sounds an awful lot like what Trump said when he was talking on MSNBC, and he said, we have nations that are out there right now that are currently funding ISIS. He brought up Saudi Arabia. He sounded like he was going to bring up Israel, but he backed off from that statement. I wonder if Senator Sanders, I wonder if Bernie agrees with that. I wonder if he thinks there are foreign powers that are funding ISIS. He seemed to hold the sentiment in 2014 that they were a threat, that they wanted, as he put it, a 7th century caliphate, now, it's interesting he brings that up, again, because there you see on the left, it's brought up a lot that Islam and Muslims are two different things for some reason, but he's using terminologies like caliphate. So I think we all know what he's talking about. Uh, the other interesting thing is his vigor. He didn't just bow his head. Now, I don't know if that's because he was being yelled at by white people as opposed to black people, but uh, Sanders got uh, upset. He got angry and he got loud and he responded. And I'm not condemning him for that. Uh, you know, why should you not uh, have a little bit of banter back and forth and have a heated argument, a heated discussion? That's what you should be there for. But um, compared to how he is now, it, it seems like a contrast. It seems like a difference. Uh, instead of just bowing his head and whole, you know, clasping his hand and standing off to the side of the stage, he uh, he confronts them and gives his opinion on Israel and Palestine and Gaza and Hamas and ISIS. So it's a uh, it's an interesting an interesting uh, little clip. And that's why I wanted to share that with you. Another piece of news would be Katrina Pearson. Now I don't know if you're familiar with this, but uh, Katrina Pearson is a spokesperson. She she's been on the media uh, quite a bit for Donald Trump. Uh, you I've seen her on God CNN uh, CNN Fox and MSNBC now I think. And every time she goes on the air, she just blows the fuck out of people. And it, it really is quite interesting because I don't think, you know, I think you found somebody. I think Trump has money well spent in a person like this because you know her name. Uh, I can't think of anybody who works on the campaigns of any other candidate, whether it's Democrat or Republican or Libertarian, it doesn't matter, that I can think of their name. I, I couldn't name somebody who works for Hillary. I couldn't name somebody who works for Bernie or Ted Cruz or Rubio or Christie or anybody else. But I know her name. And I know her name because she is damn good at what she does. Now, she went on uh, a recent interview wearing a, a necklace made out of bullets. You can imagine the reaction that got. That uh, triggered quite a few people. Now, I think that she merely showed up to the interview after going and having a meeting with Jeb Bush's campaign. I think that necklace was a subtle hint to Jeb about what he should do to get out of the situation he's in. Nonetheless, she appeared on television and the reaction to it afterwards was uh, amusing, to say the least. Uh, people were offended and triggered and brought up uh, the amount of gun violence in the United States, the murder rates, and tried to shame her and say, how could you, how dare you wear such a piece of jewelry? How, how dare you go on television with a bullet necklace? Don't you feel bad for the victims of gun violence? Are you, are you heartless? And I just want to read you her response to that because, again, this falls in line with um, Trump's mentality. And I think this is what keeps him at the top of the polls. And I think this is what his campaign understands very well, is that you can't be a typical politician. You can't bend a knee and be apologetic. You just need to stand your ground. You need to be.
be the person that is willing to say the things that other people would be either uncomfortable with or afraid of the backlash to. So her response to being um, scolded about wearing this necklace was this, and this is on uh, her Twitter account from the 29th of December. Maybe I'll wear a fetus next time and bring awareness to 50 million aborted people that will never get to be on Twitter. Talk about banter. So this, this is a woman who, I mean, my God, this is a woman who is in the frying pan and yells at the cook to turn the fucking heat up. You know, here she is getting uh, all this flack and all this heat for wearing a bullet necklace, and she just, she kicks it up a notch. She's like, let's talk about all the dead aborted babies. As you can imagine, that really pissed them off. But she shakes it off. And I, it, it really is amazing to me watching her go and do these interviews, because every time she's on a show, she refuses to let them control the narrative or the conversation. She will bring up her talking points, she will bring up her point of view, and she will not yield to them. And you see this time and time again. She is phenomenal at her job. She is the kind of PR person you want. She says things that get noticed, and she reflects what her candidate is, which is somebody who is not going to back down when somebody tries to uh, shame them, when somebody tries to bring up something to make them look bad. And we've seen this with Donald Trump multiple times. He made a comment about Muslims celebrating in New Jersey after 9-11, during 9-11, just, just after the towers fell. And for weeks, the media hammered on him. That's not true. There are no incidents of that. You're making it up. You're a liar. And then slowly, slowly as time went on, we found, about, uh, found out about newspaper articles talking about that very thing happening. And even local news stations carrying stories talking about apartment buildings being raided by the FBI because there were Muslim tenants that were celebrating on the rooftops as 9-11 happened. And watching the transition from them saying, Donald Trump is a liar and he should be ashamed, into, well, well, well okay, well, maybe it did happen, but it wasn't, it wasn't thousands, it was only hundreds. And yet, their position in the beginning was, it never happened. Now, if Donald Trump had been a typical politician... And it said, oh my God, I'm so, have I offended you? I'm so sorry. I'm a horrible liar. I, I, my God, how could I ever do that? Let me get on my knees and kiss your ass. They never would have moved from their position of it never happened to, okay, it did happen. And so she, she's gone on talk shows to talk about this. She's gone on CNN, I believe it was, uh, to talk about this. In fact, let me, let me see if I can find this clip. I believe it was Brian Stetler. If I can find Brian Stetler's clip, I will play it for you. Uh... Let me see. Just give me one moment here. Yep, I believe this is it. So I'm going to play this for you, and you can hear now, what I, I mean. I think it's to say Donald Trump does not have a high opinion of us in the press. Here's just a taste from a speech in Iowa yesterday. And you know they all want us to do badly, okay, you know, because the press is unbelievably dishonest. Unbelievably. Most of it. There's some good ones. But most of it. Unbelievably. I could tell you, oh, I think I'll write a book about them when this whole thing is finished. This will be a book. It's funny to hear him say that because my campaign sources say dozens of people have reached out to the campaign wanting access for books, some for nonfiction books, some for coffee table books. Well, in those books, whether those people get access or not, Katrina Pearson will be a main character. It's her job to work with us in the dishonest media. She is the Trump campaign's national spokesperson. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Good morning, Brian. Great to see you. Let me play the media, okay? Explain to me why people like me don't understand Donald Trump. What is it the media doesn't get? Well, first, you know, this is just, you know, human beings. You, not every interesting person is universally like, number one. Number two, you have the media sort of upset and actually whining now because Donald Trump isn't playing by their rules. And these rules don't apply to Democrats. That's the problem people What's have with example? the media. What's an example? And I'll give you a couple. Let me give you a couple of examples, Brian, because we didn't see coverage on CNN wall to wall recently when the administration came out and said they wanted to add biometrics to the vetting process for refugees. Because guess what? That's going to be in a database. But we did hear for two weeks that Donald Trump wants a database for these Muslim refugees, and it was insanity. We don't hear back-to-back -back coverage on CNN about Hillary Clinton lying to the American public knowing that we had a terrorist attack in Benghazi and she blamed an American citizen who made a video but yet we spent weeks on talking about a head count when Muslims celebrated 9-11 so I think that goes to show the dishonesty in media uh, I do think hundreds of hours of you know I love that she opens up with these two really good examples 
Trump has been criticized, and we even heard it when I had the person on to condemn a candidate, when Kyle was on, talking about Muslim databases. And yet, the first thing out of the gate she has is, well, the administration currently in power wants to use biometrics and create a database for Muslim refugees. So instantly, she brings that up and talks about the lack of coverage. The other really good example, and I think people forget about this, is the video that was blamed for the Benghazi attacks. If you remember, somebody made a YouTube video mocking the Prophet Muhammad, and there was news coverage, and I, I swear to you, it lasted for weeks and weeks, talking about how that one individual was responsible for violence and for Muslims being upset. They, they tracked him down. They, I, God, I believe they arrested him. And they tried to play it off as this was his fault. A YouTube video is what they put the blame on. And it is absolutely ridiculous. And I love that she brings that up because that, that often is not talked about uh, currently. Process for refugees because... Benghazi, you just said Muslims celebrated 9-11. Don't you mean a very small number, according to media reports, maybe a handful? No, I mean radical Muslims celebrating 9-11 in America. And let me talk about just last night from that video... How many? ...that you were talking about in Iowa. Let, let's continue mm -hmm. with the dishonesty because MSNBC said that Donald Trump abruptly left the stage from his event in North Carolina when, in fact, the full video is out there on YouTube. He talked for about an hour, took questions and answers from the audience members, and then continued to shake hands and sign books and shirts and hats and everything afterwards. Mm. So that's just completely dishonesty in the media. I, I did see that last night Trump said that Katie Turr, the NBC correspondent who was there, should be fired. I can't remember another campaign, another candidate that would call for a reporter to be fired. Did you agree with that call? Well, you know what I agree with? I agree with there's dishonesty in the media, and if it's your job, to report the news and not make it up and you're not doing your job, you should be fired. Well, what do you view the job of the press to be? Do you believe we should be fact-checking the comments that Mr. Trump makes? I think the press should be reporting both sides of the story. I mean, when was the last time you fact-checked Barack Obama? Because we haven't seen that lately. So I think as long as you're doing it that fair, all the it's time. considered journalism. Let me ask okay, you. Okay, so, this is... so hold on, Brian. So are I'm you sorry, telling me that you fact-check global warming as the cause of radical Islamic terrorists? You <laughs> I I love her tenacity. It's see this is the great thing about her as a PR spokeswoman. She doesn't just bring up great examples. She's able to bring them up at the perfect moment and just fire them off at the host. She's talking about the unfair coverage. Uh she's talking about uh, Trump getting smeared and I don't think anybody would really disagree with the notion that Trump is getting smeared. There have been articles comparing him to Hitler. There have been articles saying that he's going to be the death of America. Newscasters have gone on and almost protected opponents on the left and even in the, his own party while going after him. And so she's able to bring up examples like this. Like, global warming is the cause of terrorism. Do you remember that ridiculous notion that was put forward? It's absolutely absurd. But the news media didn't really talk about it. They brought it up once or twice, and there was almost a a neutral agreement with it rather than a challenge of how ludicrous how ridiculous that is and again she's on point when she goes on an interview and this i've seen consistently with her she's able just to hammer them but it gets better with this particular clip i'll let it play a little more here Gun that, there, are, there are some studies. The, the, the California gun control laws. Did you fact check that South that uh, California gun control laws would have prevented a terrorist attack? Did you fact? Check I'm with that? you. If you're calling for more fact checking, I'm with you on that. I think we do need more fact checking. But let me ask you. We were talking about the CNN poll. 36 percent support for Mr. Trump. Do you think media and political elites are disconnected from that support? Since our poll showed that he's supercharged by non-college educated voters. Most journalists who are who are writing stories who are on television uh, do have college degrees. So I do want. I wonder if you think that's part of the disconnect. Do you see how, yeah, you know, just analyzing this um, interview is really interesting. Because it's not just, you know, I don't want to just talk about Katrina. I, we're, this is Brian Stetler of CNN. Do you see how that's kind of like, if you've ever heard the phrase backhanded compliment, this would be a backhanded question. He's asking, do you think Donald Trump has such support, uh, you know, such great support because he's supported by nothing but fucking raging morons? That's what he's really asking. You know, oh my God, you know, I see that Donald Trump has these poll numbers. Is that because he's got uneducated inbred hillbillies voting for him? How would you answer that, Katrina? That's not a neutral question, Brian. You're basically saying that the people in the press, 
and the people voting for other candidates are too educated to be appealed to by a Donald Trump. They're too smart for him. Anybody that would find interest in him must be a uh, drooling moron to have any interest in him whatsoever. And it's ironic that she's on talking about dishonest media and, you know, their bias. And he asks her that question and he phrases it that way. And she proceeds from this point onward to basically rape him on national television. So it, it's quite entertaining. Do need more fact checking, but so I do want. I wonder if you think that's part of the disconnect between the press and the Trump campaign. No, I think the disconnect are those because many of us have college degrees too. By the way, the mm -hmm. disconnect come from those elitists who think that they know better than everyone else, like Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton, who want to just play this Jedi mind trick and tell everyone what's best for them and that they have uh, everything under control. But the reason why it's not resonating is because just like your, your previous guest had on, like Rick mm -hmm. Wilson, a GOP consultant who makes millions of dollars off the GOP and suddenly sees the gravy train drying up because you don't get it. And the echo chamber is also not the answer simply because most conservatives are not watching CNN. The problem we have here is that people are starting to see through the media bias. People know for a fact that the answer to keeping Americans safe is not to disarm them. That's what the media and the elites don't understand. Let me play a portion of uh, Mr. Trump's interview on Bill O'Reilly's show a few days ago. I thought this was striking. Take a look. Sometimes when you're up there, you get overly excited and you're speaking extemporaneously. And then you say things as anybody would because the crowd is cheering and, and, and everything's going wild that you don't know to be true, but you believe to be true, but you don't know it. I would love to read speeches off of a teleprompter, but you know what? You don't get the same excitement. You don't get the same feeling. And I haven't made very many mistakes. Now, I'm partially using a teleprompter here, partially not. I do love that Trump avoids prompters. But what I hear in that exchange is that Trump would rather be exciting than be careful with the truth. Is that fair? No, I don't think that's fair, uh, be, simply because when he's talking, he is telling people, you know, what he thinks, believes, and feels. It's not like, like just like with the whole 9-11 thing, he wasn't reading an intelligence report and then lying about it, like the current commander-in-chief and Hillary Clinton do. So he's speaking from the heart, and Americans appreciate that. They don't want these Ivy League people that, are, that go around and pay thousands of dollars to be told what they want to hear. They want to hear somebody that's real and true. And the simple fact that Mr. Trump has been around for so long, he knows what he's talking about. He means it. And people want someone that's going to go out there and be real with the American public for a change. Uh, another interesting point is Stetler brings up the fact that he plays a clip from O'Reilly where Trump is talking about he doesn't use a teleprompter. You know, that, that's one big difference. Everybody has said that Obama, when he gives a speech or he goes before uh, an audience, he'll use a teleprompter. He's not very good at off-the-cuff comments, whereas Trump likes to kind of wing it. But instead of talking about, you know, that style or why Donald Trump likes to do that, Stedler instead phrases a question to paint him as a liar. It goes from, you know, why wouldn't Donald Trump um, use a teleprompter? Why does he just go off the cuff? Why does he talk about what he feels he needs to talk about rather than a pre-planned speech or segment? And he phrases it as, is Donald Trump a liar? He doesn't have somebody fact-checking the words coming out of his mouth in real time. Think of how preposterous that is. Stetler is trying to make the argument that if you don't have somebody standing over your shoulder, double-checking everything that comes out of you in real time, then you must be lying. And you must be choosing that methodology because you're a liar. And Katrina shuts him down. She steers the conversation back to where she wants it to go. Now, this last third, it's another three minutes, and then this clip will be done. She goes in for the kill, and uh, it's quite remarkable. This is really what makes the clip itself stand out. Now, I think it's safe for a change. But if you expect honesty from the press, shouldn't we expect honesty from Mr. Trump when there are things that are factually inaccurate that he says? He did say thousands cheered on 9-11 in New Jersey, and that's not true. Well, can you prove that it's not true? Uh, yes, I can prove that it's not true because there's absolutely no documentation. There's no video. There's no photos. There's no police reports. There's no crime reports. There's no proof. There, there are no police reports. There are no police reports. There are no reports at all, Brian. Are you sure about that? Maybe you should fact check that and then we'll talk about that next time.
I would like to see them the same way that uh, Donald Trump repeatedly former called. FBI, her, former FBI agent confirmed, former New York one, police commissioner one confirmed random that news there were report. reports. That was not one random news report. You had the AP, you had the New York Post. Come on, seriously? This is why the people don't trust the media, because uh, the information is out there for wide range. It is out there, Brian. That's but why it's people actually, don't trust the media. <laughs> but the media is the ones that are made, that these, these random stories are mentioned at the FBI agent. That's a media report that came from a local TV station. Now, it doesn't really prove anything. It's just one person's <laughs> cl claim, but it was a media report. Well, would you acknowledge that the media so has played a role or not in Trump's I'm success? confused now. Are there reports there or are not reports? Now there's confused. a couple of news stories that you all have used to back up a, a claim couple, that is not, not true. Just one. But you just said one. Now you say a couple. How many is it? The, you know, I don't have the exact number. It might be four. It might be five. Oh, okay. It doesn't That's matter what I thought. because okay. there's no evidence in any report oh, it that there it were matters. thousands that were cheering. Do you think that? No, it definitely matters. Let, let me let me pivot because I don't want to go down a rabbit hole. When we, when we can't agree on the facts. Uh, I do wonder Let's if you'd go. agree, and since the theme of this hour is about Trump and the media, whether you would agree that the press has played a role in boosting Trump's campaign you know, through constant coverage. Would, would you acknowledge we're part of the success? Uh, okay, that, that final segment is fantastic. He starts out by saying, Donald Trump is lying. There are no, he said this, no news reports. There are no reports anywhere. See, the interesting thing is Stetler walked into her trap. She said, can you prove that's not true? She wants him to prove a negative. He could have walked away there, but he fell into the trap. And he actually said, there are no reports at all anywhere. No news reports, nothing. Then she gets him to admit, okay, there are reports, but they don't count. They're not, they're not good enough. But he just said there were none at all. Now he's saying there is, there's one. She follows that up by saying, are you sure it's only one? You sure there's only just the one report? And she brings up multiple sources, multiple news articles, and television programs. He then says, okay, there are a few. And this is what I was talking about earlier, and this is why this clip is so great. If Donald Trump was a typical politician, if the people in his campaign were the typical kind of people that you would have, he would have apologized. He would have backed down and said, I was wrong. And it would have hurt his poll numbers. Instead, he said what he believed, and it bared out to be true. And so now she's on television getting Stetler to admit he's, he's full of shit. She just got this guy on his own show to admit he's not only an idiot, but he's full of shit. He went from saying in the span of, I swear to God, in the span of 30 seconds, there are no news reports to there are multiple news reports. He then says, I don't want to go down the rabbit hole. What he means is I don't want to get more embarrassed on national television. Let's talk about something else. And then he tries to make her feel like she and the campaign are somehow obligated to the press that's been slandering them. Oh, well, don't you feel that our constant coverage of Donald Trump is boosting his numbers? Well, what, what are you implying? That they should be thankful to you for lying about him? No, your incompetence is what is boosting his numbers. This is one of the key things that the left and the Democrats do not understand about Donald Trump. They are fighting an old-fashioned war against him because they believe he is a typical candidate he is not a typical candidate. Your smear techniques, your um, black PR, the approaches that you would have used even four years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, will not work on him. He understands how to get his message out. He understands how to hire people like Katrina Pearson, who will go on to shows like this and wreck the host in real time. He knows the power of social media. You know, one of the interesting things about the Trump campaign, from just the social media perspective, you know, when Obama came into office, he really know he knew how to utilize the power of social media. He knew that Twitter and Facebook and YouTube and all these sites that are very popular amongst young voters were a key to his success, and he worked it very well into two terms. Donald Trump understands that too. Now, the left wing Democrats have had a head start. Obama gave them this head start. He understood how to create the mechanisms and the organizations to make a political base firmly entrenched on the internet. And yet here comes Donald Trump. He's got a Twitter account and a Facebook account and a YouTube account that has higher numbers, higher numbers than a Hillary Clinton or a Bernie Sanders. Even when you audit these accounts and you compare them side by side and strip away the fake followers that everybody uh, seemingly seems to have on Twitter from one way or another, he still holds a lead. So it's remarkable that he is tapped into social media. He's tapped into younger people and he knows how to banter. He knows how to go up against 
people like this. He knows how to go up against the mainstream media and the political machine that usually would cut the uh, knees out from under him. And he counters it time and time and time again. He'll raise an issue. He'll be challenged on it. He'll be decried for it. But within a week or two, people will either be grudgingly yielding or even agreeing with what he's raised. And it it's remarkable to watch. I don't think the left, I don't think the Democrats understand they have created the means by which they are going to be destroyed. They've, they forged this sword that's now going to be used to cut their head off. He understands what their weaknesses are, and he understands how to game the system to fight them. And he understands that they're, they're too old-fashioned. They're just, they're too out of touch. And they just don't know how to wage warfare uh, using the current means that are available. And he's, he's utilizing that advantage remarkably well. And Katrina Pearson is another example of that. He's got a fantastic spokeswoman who goes out of these shows and just just destroys people. So I'll play the very end of this clip here, and then we'll, we'll try to get the uh, crew supporter on. It worries me. When I hear Mr. Trump calling the press unbelievably dishonest, when I hear him calling for a reporter to be fired, he's eroding trust in the press. Now, he's not alone. Other Democratic <laughs> candidates, think, other Republican candidates do that, too. That. <laughs> but he is helping to erode trust in the press. The fourth estate, of course, is the press. So I, don't you think that might contribute to America being less great? Absolutely not. I mean, polls before Trump showed that a lot of people distrust the media of for course, a number of reasons. Of course, but he but, is but increasing at, that distrust. Look, well, the media probably should be a little bit more honest if that's the case. I just gave you several examples of how the media has skewed their reporting with regards to Mr. Trump, but it's not just Mr. Trump, it's Republicans in the past. If you look at the media coverage, even from the election of Barack Obama, they've essentially been covering him, not fact-checking anything Hillary Clinton or Barack Obama says. People can now take a look around and realize they have not been told the truth and the media has not been reporting accurately on practically everything this president has done. I think we can agree more fact-checking is a good thing. Katrina Pearson, Absolutely. thank you for being here. Thank you. Oh, I, I bet you agree, uh, Brian Stetler, that good fact-checking is needed more after you just got raped on national television by a woman. Uh, who looks fantastic, by the way. Katrina Pearson is a very attractive, well-spoken, intelligent spokeswoman. And, uh, of course, he wants uh, more fact-checking. The lack of fact-checking just got him his ass handed on his own show. That That's remarkable to me. And that's not just a one-time thing. If you go look her up on YouTube, I guarantee you, you'll get a good hour or two of laughter out of this woman. She goes on to show after show after show and utterly destroys all the people she talks to. I've yet to see her get... Uh, tripped up. I have yet to see her stumble. She's always very well-spoken, very articulate, and she always makes them look worse than they make her look, which is what you want in a PR spokesperson. I will take a look at the uh, the Meadowcast tag here, see if anybody has anything interesting to say, and then I'm going to pull in the Ted Cruz supporter, and we'll go from there. Uh, Patriotic Assassin says, I have total respect for this woman, and she's right. We don't trust the media, and Trump is more honest than the rest. I agree. Um, again, he's trying to make them feel like they owe him, or, yeah, they're trying to make Trump and his campaign and other politicians in general feel like that the press is owed something. Like the fourth estate is some kind of, um, an aristocratic title, you know, that their merit has earned them their position in society. That's not true. The press has failed in nearly every regards, be it mainstream or even alternative at this point. Uh, and it's ridiculous that they're trying to make it seem like Trump not only should be indebted to them, for getting him poll numbers somehow, but he should feel sorry for talking badly about them. Oh, don't you think the mistrust of the media is somehow his fault? Are you kidding me? You just made yourself look like an asshole on television, Brian Stetler. That wasn't Donald Trump doing that. That was Brian Stetler doing that. That was CNN doing that. That was other people like Anderson Cooper and Don Lemon. And don't get me wrong, it's not just, uh, it's not just CNN. It's Fox and MSNBC. All of them have issues. It just seems like recently we've been mostly seeing CNN and MSNBC fuck up time and time again. Uh, another one from Patriotic Assassin. Man, I like how that bitch just wants to storm up there and kick his ass. Need the popcorn for that. She uh, she definitely kicks ass and uh, takes names. She, she is not a soft-spoken uh, spokesperson. She likes to get in there, make her point, and she will challenge people when she believes they're wrong. And that's what you want in PR. I, I don't understand how people would not want that. 
Seems like that guy was taking the pull approach of, I've stockpiled all these gold bars, I need to use them somehow. I believe Patriotic Assassin is referring to the uh, previous guest on the segment, uh, Pitch a Candidate, Chris. Uh, yeah, uh, well, you know, maybe following, uh, God, who was it? Um, I, I'm blanking on his name now. He was the person who had a show on CNN, then moved to Fox, and now he's on his own. The uh, allegedly, oh, uh, <laughs> Glenn Beck. The Glenn Becker, Alex Jones approach of buy gold. You'll see that a lot if you watch any of their content. They always have that promoter, the uh, commercial, the infomercial that comes on. Put your money into gold. Gold is safe. Gold will never never treat you wrong. I, I know what you're talking about. Uh, somebody's asking for links to her stuff. Uh, again, uh, I'll spell her name out. I'll try to put some links up uh, later on here for you if I can find it. Uh, you know, the multiple different sources, but it's Katrina, K-A-T-R-I-N-A, Pearson, P-I-E-R-S-O-N. And all you have to do is search that on YouTube, and I guarantee you, you will find a good hour or two worth of uh, entertainment. All right, so I'm going to try to bring in the crew supporter here. Uh, let me just uh, give me one moment, and I'll get him here. Again, if you have any questions or comments for the next segment or for any part of the show, it's Metocast, just the hashtag M-E-T-O-C-A-S-T. I will try to bring them up uh, while I'm talking to them, and I'll, I'll bring them up as the show goes on. So it looks like we're good to go. I'm going to call them up and uh, bring them in. Hey, Jim, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, how oh, do you okay. how, uh, just so you know, we're on the air. And then um, how do you want me to refer to you as we go ahead on this? Um, well, let's see. My personal pronouns are Jim. <laughs> Um, you can just call me Jake. That that'll do. Okay. Well, I will check my cis lord shit privilege. Uh, and, you know, and I will okay. call I will call you Jake going forward. All so, right, and and I'll be fact checking everything you say. By the way, and if you say something slightly off key, we're gonna get rid of your YouTube channel. Oh, holy shit! Hopefully, Brian Settler doesn't come after me because I'll have to hide in a dumpster somewhere to avoid the wrath of Brian Settler. Now, I, I was having you come on. I can't remember. Was it to pitch or was it to condemn or was it both? What What did you want to do? Primarily, it was to pitch Ted Cruz, but um, I, I think there's sort of been a change of plans. Um, I went to a Ted, or uh, excuse me, I went to a Donald Trump rally. Um, okay. must have been Wednesday, so I thought I might talk a little bit about him too. Yeah. And I know you. I know you were talking about him uh, just a few seconds ago, um, and especially one of his uh, his aides that went on whatever news organization that was. Oh yeah, and, that uh, Katrina Pearson. Yep. Right. Right. And that does lead into a lot of uh, Ted Cruz's success, and the reason why he's become so popular today is, um, in essence, he's ridden on the coattails of Donald Trump's popularity. But um, like like you're talking about the whole Donald Trump celebrating uh, Muslim, or sorry, Muslim celebrating 9/11. Um, I actually had that article in front of me about two or three weeks ago, and recently, after Donald Trump made those remarks. The Washington Post completely got rid of that, and um, oh yeah, I, I, I remember uh, the reporter that did the story um, said, "Oh, that was a mistake. We need to pull that." And then that was the reporter that Donald Trump was talking about at a rally, and he was making fun of him for being stupid. But then they they right. took the clip of that and said, "Oh my God, look, he's he's mocking a disabled man." Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And now the Washington Post is completely uh, going backwards and downstream on what they published back. Uh, Let's see, September 18th, 2001. I'll send you the link on here, and it's got the, um, a little bit of what he was talking about. Give me one second. Yeah, yeah, take your time. I, I know, too, that uh, mysteriously, uh, clips of some of the local coverage uh, that was covering 9-11 and the, the alleged uh, celebrations afterwards uh, have been being pulled down from YouTube. So I don't know if that is in relation to the content owner suddenly becoming aware of them or, or what, but I, I've noticed a... I, I almost want to say a directed effort on the part of people that had reported on this to remove the sources and to try to disavow, um, you know, uh, that these accounts happened or that they reported on them or they were somehow misreported and they need to add addendums and to fix them. It's 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 interesting to watch happen. Oh yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. And if it goes if it goes against the agenda of the Democratic Party, you can almost guarantee they're going to take down whatever it is and try to destroy Trump. Um, uh, let's see here. I just sent you the link on there. Um, okay. I, can, I can read a portion of what that said. Uh, it says, quote, 
And investigators said at least two of the hijackers, Nawak al-Hazim and Salam al-Hazami, are believed to have addressed uh, addresses in Wayne and Fort Lee, New Jersey. Uh, they apparently rented a mailbox in Fort Lee, um, blah, 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 within two hour, or sorry, within hours of two jetliners plowing in the World Trade Center. Law enforcement authorities detain and question a number of people who are allegedly seen celebrating the attacks and holding tailgate-style parties on rooftops while they watch the devastation on the other side of the river. Now, it seems to me that police officers wouldn't make a report on somebody having a tailgate party on top of a building watching the Twin Towers fall unless there was some merit to it. Yeah, it would be very awkward. Well, yeah, there, there are a few things with that. How are you going to spot a tailgate party on top of a building unless people are reporting it, you know what I mean? Exactly. And, and, and the other thing, too, is who the hell has tailgate parties on top of rooftops in the middle of the damn day? You know, it, when 9-11 happened, it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't uh, some festive occasion. So right, they, right. they were reacting to something that was going on, you know what right. I mean? And um, it's all very mysterious. I, I've noticed a lot of the coverage on it. Uh, with people going back and trying to retcon it, essentially, uh, it's very shady. And so watching somebody like Pearson go on to CNN and argue with uh, Stetler and others, um, I think she has a point. I, I think the media uh, has been dishonest and unfair in its coverage. And I don't think that's just with Donald Trump. Uh, you know, even with Ted Cruz, my God, there was a cartoonist who uh, drew pictures of uh, Cruz's children. You know, as, as monkeys, right. Yeah, and I saw the uh, the image because I was torn on it. I didn't know, you know, I, I believe everything is fair game. That's just my personal opinion. And I know that political uh, satirists have done just really horrible shit in the past. That That's kind of a common trait. So I thought, all right, well, maybe, maybe he did something really bizarre with his kids. But then I went and watched the video. And the whole video is just, it's Ted Cruz at home with his family reading uh, politicized uh, Christmas tales. Right, a Christmas story. Yeah, yep, I saw that video too. Yeah, talking about um, his political career. It's the most uh, benign, mundane thing you could think of. There's, there's absolutely nothing offensive. He's not using his kids as political props as they're trying to push forward. You know, if Barack Obama had done a, a commercial like that, I wouldn't have criticized him for it either. It, it's such a innocent commercial. And then looking at her reaction to that, you know, I, I couldn't figure it out. And then when I looked into it more, it turned out that she, she apparently has a major issue with Ted Cruz. She does not like him, and she has uh, gone after him in the past repeatedly, apparently. Well, that, that's what, you know, that's what the Democratic Party, and that's what their wing of the media does, is if you're Republican, and if you disagree with any of their ideology or any of their agenda, they're going to go after you personally. Uh, they're, I mean, it, it's crazy what they do nowadays. The, the media is essentially a, a, a branch or a wing of the Liberal Party today, or the Democrat Party, I should say. Uh, they've essentially become a, a branch of the government in Barack Obama's sense. Um, I, I just find it repulsive how they report media today. And take this for example. I was at a Ted Cruz event. Um, must have been two or three months ago. And uh, I, I remember seeing in the back, there were a few cameras set up. I think CNN was there. And this is in South Carolina, by the way. CNN was there. A few other local agencies were there. I listened to the entire event. I watched Ted Cruz, listened to what he said. And then I went back and looked at the logs and the transcripts of what the media had put out. And everything was just completely backwards. And it's the same way for Donald Trump, too. Um, they, they just like to twist and pull things like it's string cheese. It's insane. Well, isn't it remarkable, too? You know, I, at least with the Republicans, it almost seems like the media is intentionally trying to do anything it can to... Um, short change the front runners. You know, obviously Trump is ahead in the polls, but Cruz is up there too. And Rubio's, right. Rubio has support as well. But it's funny when you look at, uh, you compare them to somebody like Jeb Bush. When the media talks about Jeb Bush, they're not really bringing up the fact that his poll numbers are dismal and that Absolutely. he spent the most money. They talk about him in almost a praising way, like they want him to get the nomination because they know and, he has no support. Right. And they do want Jeb Bush to get the nomination, primarily because he doesn't have any support, and they know he's not going to win against Hillary Clinton. And I guarantee you that if Hillary Clinton gets the Democratic nomination, Jeb Bush will stand no chance against her. And that's why they absolutely want Jeb Bush to be the front runner. And I mean, that's just the way they've, they've worked for the past you know, two or three decades. Um, that's the way they, they tried to work it out for you know, the 2012 election um, and the 2008 election. Um, yeah, I, I, I just can't stand watching CNN anymore. I can't watch CNNBC anymore. Um, I, I, I barely can stand Fox News anymore. Now I pretty much just stick to Drudge Report 
and I stick to whatever news articles come up on there. And you know, he picks and chooses different articles from different websites to put on his front page. But yeah, I, the, I the, the only uh, the only people I really watch at this point, um, unless it's like uh, Fox News, if they send Leland out to like a riot, is usually entertaining. Right. Um, yeah. But but outside of that, um, it, it, honestly, I get my news from online sources, or I go to um, C-SPAN. Because usually yeah. C-SPAN will just play it. They don't really overlay commentary on it. It's just, here's a House uh, committee meeting, or you know here's here's a speech from a politician, and that's it. And you can watch that for an hour or two, and then we'll show you something else. And there's, yeah, really, absolutely. there's really no input into it. Uh, you know, I agree with you that the Fourth Estate, you know, they refer to themselves as this kind of benevolent organization, you know, uh, the, the watchers of society that keeps right. an eye out for them. Yeah. But they've really failed in that duty. Um, okay, so let, let's jump into, we'll do, uh, we'll do pitch a candidate and then we'll have time and we can jump into condemn if you want to as well. Um, sure. why don't you tell us who your candidate is and why don't you tell the people watching what would appeal to them and why they should vote for that person? All right. Well, uh, <clears throat> my candidate is Ted Cruz and, um, I, I particularly like Ted Cruz because he believes in a constitutional Republic. I mean, we, we live in a constitutional federal Republic right now but we're slowly drifting away from those ideals. Um, he thinks that the Constitution should remain central to making laws and uh, should remain central for the Supreme Court on interpreting laws. And he believes that unconstitutional executive orders, like the ones Barack Obama has put in place, should be immediately removed. Um, he believes in a closed border system, uh, a system that doesn't allow immigrants, or excuse me, illegal immigrants or terrorists to bring harm to Americans. Um, we, we see problems with our border system today, and you, you hear Democrats like Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton talking about, oh, yes, well, um, I think we should uh, make sure that people come here the right way. They don't specifically say, well, we should close the border. Uh, they just talk about how we should bring more people in to uh, essentially vote for the Democrat Party. And that's pretty much what the Democrats want right now is uh, a large population of people uh, for them to basically lord over and have them vote them into office every election cycle. Uh, that's the primary purpose of the, you know, uh, amnesty, uh, amnesty that the Democrats have been pushing for a while. Um, You'd argue that it's a, a second wave of the entitlement system, that they, they secure votes by providing services and appealing to those groups to keep themselves in power. Oh, absolutely. And that's what goes on today, not only just with uh, immigrant populations, um, take a look at uh, minority populations, for example. Um, if you're single and you happen to be African American, you have a whole bunch of children, um, you make below a certain amount of money every year, you're automatically entitled to more welfare per child. And those children that grow up don't grow up with the father, they grow up with the federal government as their father. So essentially, you're raising a whole population and an army of people that are going to continue to vote for the Democrat Party regardless of what their ideology is as long as they get a check in the mail and it's the same way with you know the education system you know we're we're allowing liberal professors to I uh, you could say infiltrate the education system and uh, pretty much train a, a new army of uh, kids to vote Democrat because Republicans are evil white Islamophobic uh, heterosexual males, and that's just wrong in this day and age. Oh, I, I, I don't think most people would even disagree with you on that. I mean, that's that's kind of how I see it. I think, um, at least, especially at the university level, I mean, you know, setting aside stuff like Common Core, where the creator of that actually said one of the motivations for him creating that was uh, a reaction to white privilege. But yeah, set, setting, setting that aside, even at the university level, I, I think we're seeing more and more stories come out of college kids that feel like once they get into university, they need to keep their mouth shut, and they need to agree with the, the political party line that's put forward by the um, administration, because if they don't, they're going to suffer either through their grades, or they'll be expelled. I mean, you can look at the lunacy related to Title IX and rape accusations, where they have their own tribunals now on college campuses, and the, the accuser basically gets to dictate what they find offensive, and the college basically has to take it at its word with no evidence. So right, it, right. you have this system in American education where kids are going in there and even if they're not indoctrinated they're basically taught the message that different opinions aren't okay that arguing an idea is not okay that free speech doesn't exist that hate speech is a real thing that they're bad people because 
uh, their they, ancestors owned slaves 200 years ago. Right. And, and the funny thing is, you know, when you look at the kids that do get indoctrinated or when you look at the kids that advocate this, they will never, you know, in relation to social justice and other things, they'll never bring up socioeconomics. They'll never talk about the, you know, differences in society based on income because they're all, you know, generally speaking, they're all well off, middle class, suburbanite uh, kids that grew up in a nice house and had lots of money and didn't have any interactions with any of these oppressed groups. And yet they're dictating to the kid that had to work his ass off to get in there what the reality of the world is. And the professors kind of back that up and they basically tell that kid, keep your mouth shut and don't say anything to disagree because if you do, you're a bigot, you're a racist, you're a sexist, transphobic, homophobic, shit lord, and you don't have a right to speak. And I absolutely agree with that. I, I think a lot of people are starting to kind of see that the education system has really gotten off the tracks. I mean, even even groups dedicated or founded by, uh, you know, old-fashioned liberals like FIRE, uh, Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, mm -hmm. yep. said the same thing. He's like, I'm a liberal. I was at college, you know, I was one of the hippie kids. I agreed with them. We, you know, we were fighting against an administration that wouldn't let us have free speech, but the problem is when we got into power, it wasn't free speech we were advocating, it was our speech. And Absolutely. so he finds himself defending, on the whole, a majority of conservatives. So I'm sorry to, I, I'm getting off track here. I don't want to take your time up, but I, no, absolutely, no, I'm, I'm fine I, I absolutely agree with you on that point. And I, I know firsthand the effects that, you know, liberal ideology and propaganda has in schools. I'm, um, I'm going to go ahead and throw this out there. Um, I'm 17 years old. Um, I'm still in high school. I'm about 30 days away from being a registered voter in South Carolina, so I'll be able to vote in the early primaries. Um, and you know what the, the, the funniest thing about that is? I'm, I'm reading the chat right now and comments coming at us. Uh, they're saying you're the most well-spoken uh, and best guest <laughs> I've had on here yet. And I believe you are officially the youngest. I don't think anybody has been below the age of 20. So 17 well, is the youngest by far. Kyle Cuck uh, definitely sounded somewhat young. I, I believe he is 20 or 21. You know, I've never asked his age, but I'm just assuming he's college-aged. I could, yeah, I, could be, I could be wrong, though. But uh, go ahead. I'm well, you know, I'm, I'm not too excited about moving on to college. Uh, the college that I want to go to, or actually it's a university, is out west. And from, from my point of view, I think it's going to be generally set apart from the other ones in South Carolina that typically advocate for, uh, you know, liberals teaching and for – well, I'm, I'm not saying that in a bad way, that all liberals are bad who teach. Um, one of my teachers at the school I attend happens to be a liberal. And he happens to believe that uh, ideology should, should stay out of schools, that schools should remain part of education and school should, schools' role should only be to educate students and not to indoctrinate them. Um, and I, I just, I, I don't know exactly what to think going into college. Um, it's three or four months away for me right now. But I can tell you I'm probably not going to enjoy it very much if, if I'm indoctrinated most of the time. Well, my recommendation to you, um, I, don't, I don't know what field of study you want to go into, but um, my recommendation would be uh, try out a community college to get an associate's, whatever kind of associate's it is. Uh, it'll save you cost and you don't have to deal with as much of the shit that you would on a normal university. Right. And right. it lets you limit your university time for your actual bachelor's degree to two years, uh, you know, and if you want to go for master's or PhD after that, obviously you'll have to, to deal with the groups. I really wish that there was a, um, a website. I, I know there's ratemyprofessor.com, but I wish there was a similar site for colleges and universities where people that actually attend them can tell people and rate them based on a system of how much of this shit is actually on campus. Give them a real opinion like, hey, if you're going to come uh, to the U of M, if you're going to go to, uh, you know, Arkansas State or wherever you're going to go, this is the kind of social justice you'll find. These are the kind of professors you'll find. These are the student bodies that exist. This is the kind of everyday um, hallway interaction you're going to face. Because I think college students, people going into university, should know where their money is going and know what they're really getting into. You're sold this bill of goods about how the education program is, but you're not really told what it's like to interact with students and administration. And I think that would be helpful. Right, right. Well, the website you're mentioning, um, I can tell you right now, for the events that are going on in Mizzou, uh, Mizzou um, I can tell you there's going to be no social justice there in a little while, you know, with, on, with the track that they're on. It, you remember that video of the female professor who was pushing back the Asian photographer and videographer because he was getting pictures for some reason. Do, do you remember that video? 
Um, yeah, that was the one who kept screaming to people. She had her hug box circle of individuals out on the grass, and she kept yelling, right. uh, bring me muscle, bring me muscle, yeah. we need to get him get out of here. More, get me more muscle out of out here. Uh, they they surrounded the this Asian kid, and then they start walking backward and pushing him backwards so he can't stay you know, on his feet. And as they're doing that, they're saying, oh, oh, oh why are you, stop pushing us, you, you can't push us. And the kid's just like, well, I'm not, I'm just trying to get a picture. That he was just trying to get a picture, and for some reason, they couldn't stand that. Yeah, I, I found that remarkable. I mean, here's somebody who is you know, essentially press, and he's just trying to record what's going on, and he gets surrounded by multiple people and physically assaulted. And it was a physical assault. You it know, was, they, yeah. they kept trying this game of, oh, I'm just walking, I'm just moving, when it's like 12 of them circling him and then walking him out of the area to the point where they finally just outright said, she outright stated, get me muscle. We need it, to get him out of here. It's like watching third graders on the playground trying to bully other kids. It, it's absolutely insane that that's become part of campus life. And I, I think that unless we move away from that anytime soon, education as we know it is going to be completely changed. And that's part of the reason why uh, the United States is behind in education in the world. is because we've moved away from teaching students the stuff that they need to know and instead teaching students how bad America is and how good Iran is and how good Palestine is and how we need to bow down to them and give them money. And it, it's insane. But I'm, I'm getting off topic here. Oh, that, that's fine. Uh, we've got plenty of time. But um, uh, yeah, go, go ahead and uh, continue on. All right. Well, uh, OK, I guess we can move away from education now because I've already said my stuff. But back to Ted Cruz. Um, so I think we were talking about uh, a closed border system, which he believes in. Um, he believes that abortion is wrong, obviously, that Planned Parenthood should be under criminal investigation. And abortion, with the exception of, you know, the mother is going to be harmed or, or rape should be allowed. Um, I, I happen to agree with that. I, I think it's insane for the Democrat Party to say that, um, you know, the death row is bad because we're executing hardened criminals and that they're not really that bad. They're, they've just been in the system too long. And that, oh, well, you know, fetuses, get rid of them. They're, that's not a life. Don't worry about that. It, it's a very big double standard, and I think it's very hypocritical on their part. Um, well, it, yeah, I think a lot of the, um, the coverage, and especially the videos that have come out about Planned Parenthood where they had these different meetings, um, talking about what they do with the fetuses and the discarded uh, aborted babies afterwards and the profit margins on stem cells and parts uh, was really disturbing. And uh, watching kind of the reaction from politicians on that was somewhat remarkable. It was the I stand with Planned Parenthood. You know, I, it, it's, it's so macabre. It's so eerie to watch that kind of stuff. Absolutely. And, and, and the, media, the media plays into it like it's nothing. They say, oh, well, like Barack Obama said, that they were completely altered videos. And I remember one of my liberal teachers saying that too. He said, oh, well, you know, the, the, the videos were just altered to show how bad Planned Parenthood is, and they, they're not really that bad. They're there to help women. Well, how were they altered, though? I mean, you could say that they edited it, fair enough, but the statements those people made were still what they said. They didn't dub over what they, you know, right, it wasn't right. like they brought in an anime cast. You know what I mean? Like, Funimation wasn't on set to dub over and make the lady say, I'm going to buy a Ferrari with dead baby parts. She right. said that. And the as, fact as that... Bar oh, oh, go ahead. It, it, yeah, that, that is remarkable to me, and I, I found it disgusting. Um, as far as I go on the abortion issue... I'm really hands off on it, um, but when I see it turned into a business like that, and I see that they have a profit margin for the amount of dead babies they can procure, that seems like there's a, an issue there, and that seems like that should be something that most definitely should be investigated. Right, I, I agree with you on that. And uh, back to what you were saying about the videos, um, Barack Obama's term was quote heavily doctored, and I remember him saying that over and over again. The media picked it up like monkeys and started repeating it constantly, heavily doctored videos. And that's what my teacher said. Um, and I, I agree with your stance that, you know, just leave abortion alone. Um, but as a Ted Cruz supporter, and, you know, a majority of his supporters happen to be evangelical Christians, that, that's his base right now, evangelical Christians. Um, as an evangelical Christian myself, I, I happen to think abortion is wrong and everybody's entitled to their own opinion. Everybody's entitled to think what's life and what's not. Um, I'm sending you a video right now um, of an abortion survivor 
I don't know if you want to play just a portion of that. Um, well, I, I, I could I could try to, but um, it would be audio only. Is that going to have the same impact, yeah, that, or is it mostly visual? You can you can do audio too. Um, if people saw a picture of her, wouldn't really make that much of a difference. Um, so, I, well, I have to ask, just out of morbid curiosity, how is one an abortion survivor? Did she fight off the forceps? Like, how do you, how do you, sur <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like there's a little fetus boxing with the doctor's fingers. Like, how did well, she? Well, there's different types of abortions. You know, there's one where they suck you out of the womb with a vacuum. There's one where they inject a saline solution um, into the. I don't know what you call it. It's not really an egg sac. It's something that protects the, the fetus itself and holds water inside of there. Um, this particular abortion survivor was a saline abortion survivor. And, you know, there's all sorts of different kinds that happen to survive. There's people who are... Um, so did, did her mother get a refund? Like if I hire a plumber to come in and unclog the toilet and the toilet's still clogged, I'm going to either get him back to finish the job or I'm going to get my money back. So they, they saline flush this woman to abort the baby. And then what, what happened in nine months, you know, eight months later, or seven months later, she, she suddenly had the kid and she's like, Oh, uh, I guess I, you didn't complete the job. I think that, um, her mother actually went home and must've delivered her or something like that. I don't know. She explains it very clearly in the video. She talks about, um, you know, her experience and the negative effects it's brought upon her now that she's living and alive. But if you just want to play like, I don't know, two or three minutes of that, um, I think the audience will get the picture. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Let me cue it up. I'll, I'll put the audio on here. I'm going to mute myself. Uh, just let me make sure. Okay. Here we go. You might want to skip to about one minute. Okay, one minute in? Yep. All right, one second here. Let me pull that up. So could you tell us a little bit about your, your experience in your life? <laughs> yes. Um, I, uh, I'm adopted, and my biological parents were 17, and my biological mother was seven and a half months pregnant when she decided to have a saline abortion, which is a saline salt solution that's injected into the mother's womb. The baby gulps that solution, it burns the baby inside and out, and then she's to deliver a dead baby within 24 hours. So after being burned alive in my mother's womb for approximately 18 hours, I was delivered alive at an abortion clinic. Now, now this is... Um... Wait, I have to pause it here. Uh, I've heard of, you know, there's a trimester limit on abortions, but she's saying that they tried to saline abort her and then she was delivered 18 hours later? Yeah, well, like she said, it was, I think it's 24 hours after the baby is delivered and it's supposed to be dead. Um, who's the, the abortion doctor, Gosling? Uh, I'm sure you remember Gosling, the guy who had an abortion clinic up in New York. He would simply deliver the babies early or late and then he would take a pair of scissors and cut their necks and then throw them in a freezer for no good reason. Um, like, like I said, you know, there are many different ways you can uh, abort uh, a child. Well, I guess what I should say is th this is verifiable. I mean, this is, this is legitimate. This isn't somebody oh, yeah. just... Oh, yeah. This is, this is absolutely legitimate. This interview that you're listening right now is after she, she made a speech. And I, I think if you look in the suggestions on the right-hand side of the video... Her speech might be up there. Um, oh, yep. Her name is Jana Jensen. Yep, I, I see it up there. All right, I'll, I'll let the video uh, keep playing. But I, I was a little taken aback by that, that uh, they did the procedure and then she, she was delivered 18 hours later. It was a little, right, right. Uh, a little shocking. Okay. Yeah. It burns the baby inside and out, and then she's to deliver a dead baby within 24 hours. So after being burned alive in my mother's womb for approximately 18 hours, I was delivered alive at an abortion clinic. Uh, now, now, this is um, uh, for, amazing. It's, it's, you're, very, you're very lucky. Now, now how, how lucky are you? How, how many people survive this thing? Uh, is this Not very many. I mean, I, I've met other abortion survivors, but we don't have a little club. We don't all get it together once a month, but it's just, we are out there, which is very rare. Yeah, and, and, you're, and you've um, survived pretty well compared to um, a lot of other, because it's, it's very damaging, obviously. Yeah, it's meant to have, kill you. I should have uh, burns, and I should be blind, and, you know, 
I shouldn't be doing so well, but my medical okay, are records you at 240 state now? on them, born during say. Uh, no, no, I'm at 217. I can skip ahead. We'll play another okay, minute no, of it. Okay, just, just let it play. Um, almost there. Okay. Alien abortion, and my birth certificate was signed by an abortionist. So, that's interesting. By the very abortionist who was um, paid to, to, kill, to me. kill But as I always say, if abortion is merely about women's rights, then what were mine? Right. So you were, as you said during the talk, there was uh, no um, radical feminist um, pro-choice pro person fighting for your choice, for your rights. Right. It uh, puts, <laughs> puts a different light on things when, you, uh, when you're talking to someone who has actually uh, uh, survived. We're talking about, you know, a person. Right, right. And that's, the, um, and that's, that's what's always missing. And um, mm -hmm. so there's a choice that affects another person. That is, uh, that's, that's, uh, I don't think I've ever heard a story like that. I've never heard of anybody who was not only, a, a, you know, an attempt to abort them, but then they're delivered hours later and they have their certificate signed by the abortionist that was trying to kill them. It, it's, it's, it, I, I think it's um, a little bit sad that this this has happened, and I I think it's great that she's still alive today and she's able to talk about it. And, and you're it, you're absolutely sure this is real. This isn't like a promotion. Oh, I'm, for, I'm positive. I I this, did my research. I saw this about maybe three or four years ago when it first came out. It says December 11, 2007. I'm 100 percent positive this is real. Okay, because it, it sounds like a promotion for Sh uh, M Night Shyamalan's uh, Unbreakable or something. No, like th no. this woman can't be put down. They tried to burn her alive, and she crawled her way out, and then kicked the abortionist's ass. No, that this is this is legitimate. This is actually what happens. I mean, if you survive an abortion, you are a very rare case of, of humankind or whatever you want to call it. Uh, saline is a very uh, harmful solution, especially when you pump it into a, a fetus that is uh, just starting to grow. And if you made it to the point where she said it, she has cerebral palsy because of it, and she, she can't function 100% because of it, but she's still able to talk, and that's why she's, um, I'm sure you can see in the video, I don't know if the audience can, that she's sitting down in a few rows of chairs. That's because she just uh, stood up and gave her speech regarding it. But um, anyway, I think I'm about done with uh, that soundbite. I don't know how far you got because I can't hear. Oh no, but... no, that, that's fine. I played about the first uh, from minute, you know minute one to minute three. It's a seven minute clip. Okay, um, work. I'll put the link up for anybody that wants to see it um, later on after the show, so they can go take a look sure. at it and investigate it and see what they think of it. The chat is uh, <laughs> the chat is a little bit floored by it. So. W in relation to Ted Cruz's stance on abortion, now you said he had an evangelical base that he believes that abortion should only be available to people that were raped. And what was the other the other uh, um, the case of rape, or in the case of I've, I've heard of times when a mother's life may be at risk, where um, there might be some sort of rare condition where a mother may die in childbirth, and physicians happen to know about it prior to the birth. Um, and I've I've heard of people getting abortions because of that, because they know well I'm my chances of dying are going to be a lot higher. But ultimately it comes down to, um, you, you probably heard her say it, uh, what about her rights? What about her rights as a human being? Because she's obviously alive now. And obviously uh, liberals who advocate for abortion think that she should be dead or think that she should have died during the abortion process. But she's not dead now. She's, she's still alive and kicking. <laughs> So with, with something like this, let, let's talk about uh, Cruz's stance on abortion, because I think that's going to impact how a voter might see him. So tell me a little bit about Ted Cruz. Now, this obviously appeals to the evangelical base. Now, is Ted Cruz a pretty devout uh, Christian? Is he pretty hardcore evangelical? Is this a, a more moderate opinion for him? Is this more extreme opinion for him? Uh, kind of how does he fall with his religious values kind of directing his political platform? Well, you know, uh, Ted Cruz is a Baptist. I, I think he's a Southern Baptist. He's obviously from Texas, so it would make sense that he would be a Southern Baptist. And Southern Baptists are completely against abortion from what I've heard. And I, I live in South Carolina. I know some Southern Baptists, and I know that they're against abortion. And some of the other ones that I talk to, um, they're neutral. For Ted Cruz, though, whether this is neutral or extreme, uh, Ted Cruz has been saying this for a long time, and so has a lot of uh, Ted Cruz's colleagues, that abortion is bad, and he's been saying this before Planned Parenthood. Um, I know I've heard of him saying it before Planned Parenthood, that abortion is wrong. Um, 
But like you said, towards his extreme or moderate, I'm honestly not sure. I can't say with certainty. Um, well, does, does his, I, I guess, well, let me phrase it like this. Um, on an issue like this, it would be evident that um, his religious background obviously affects his politics. That, that would be one of the reasons why he would have this kind of position. Right. Um, are there any other policies that you know of that he has that are backed by a religious perspective? Would you say relations with other nations? Would you say the tax code, you know, in regards to charity or something like that, a separation of church and state? Has he made any statements or policies regarding anything else where he'd be like, okay, well, you should be aware of this as well? Right. Well, he has said that we need a separation of church and state, and I, I can try to find a link for you right now. Um, but he has said that we need separation of church and state. Uh, he's backed the State Marriage Defense Act. Um, he's backed the Partial Birth, excuse me, Partial Birth Abortion Act, which bans late-term abortions. Um, if you want to talk about his tax code, uh, his flat tax, I guess, if you want to transition to that. In relation to a, a tithe, I guess you you could make an analogy there. Uh, okay, well, yeah, we'll we'll transition to that. The only reason I bring this up is um, you're getting a lot of fedoras tipped at you right now, oh. uh, as they tell me to <laughs> as they tell me to abort the Christ cuck. Um, I, I just want to remind chat and the people listening. Um, the whole point of the segment is to let you pitch it however you want to pitch it. I mean, I get it. You know, obviously, somebody who isn't religious might be turned off by Ted Cruz. But if that's Ted Cruz's stance, at least you know what it is now. I mean, that's kind of the whole point, is to let you know what does a candidate think, why does he think that, and if you were going to vote for him, what you should be aware of. So um, right, it, and it, I, it's good to know that. It's good to know that that is part of what Ted Cruz uses to shape his political opinions. Right. And I just want to make one thing clear to the people who are calling me Christ cuck or whatever. Um, I like most Muslims in America who simply want to spread their ideology and want to impose it on others, sort of how the Democrat Party is doing, I don't think that I should impose my beliefs on other people. Whoever's tipping the fedoras, you can believe whatever you want to, and you're welcome to do that. And I'm not going to force you to believe in Jesus Christ. I'm not going to force you to believe abortion is wrong. I'm, I'm just simply saying what I've been raised to believe and what I firmly believe is is correct. So that's that's how it is with Ted Cruz. Ted Cruz was raised uh, a devout, um, Baptist. devout Southern Baptist, right? Okay. And so that's that's his belief. But moving oh, on. Oh, okay. Yeah, we'll we'll move into um, we'll move into flat tax. Just one thing. I had somebody uh, throw up a question. I, I figure it's fair because it's on point. Uh, Derek Jason Chaplin asks: If abortion is made illegal, is the government going to fund medical expenses for childbirth? That's a fucking lot. And maybe not even maybe not even childbirth, but you know, if a woman can't abort because let's say the child has a genetic defect or a severe illness, you know, it's not threatening her life to give birth and it's not the result of a rape, and the government is telling her you can't have the baby you have to have the baby, you can't have an abortion, it doesn't fall into these two categories. Has has Ted Cruz addressed what a parent or a mother is to do in that situation where she's going to have a lifelong burden of financially trying to get treatment for this child who hypothetically has some terrible condition that's going to make life difficult for them and need a lot of medical care. Well, right. That, that's what Medicaid is in place for. You know, South Carolina has their own Medicaid, uh, um, their own Medicaid system set up so that if you do have a child that um, has some sort of defect or something, then you're, you're going to get government assistance for it. Um, I know the Medicaid system has helped out my brother in particular because my brother uh, suffered a, a brain injury when he was about 10 or 11, um, I think it was summer of 2012, uh, a swing set hit him on the head, crushed his skull. Um, and I, I remember the day it happened, uh, a helicopter, they had to call in a helicopter to airlift him to a nearby hospital because he was in such a traumatic state that they didn't think he was going to live. They needed to evacuate him pretty quickly. They took him to the hospital. Um, they started operating on him immediately, and he was in a coma for roughly... Uh, about two months before he woke up. And wh when he woke up, um, he was a vegetable. He was like most people who get shot in the head and manage to live. Um, they don't function correctly. And after that, we thought, well, he's just going to be a vegetable for the rest of his life. He's not going to be able to talk or, or eat like normal people. We're just going to have to pump in full of, of his food. And, you know, that raises some... some uh, 
uh, some costs for people and, you know, for the cost of living for people that have disabilities. And I know it doesn't really relate to, to birth and everything, but that's what the Medicaid system is set up for. Um, well, I guess, well um, let, me, let me go off of this then, We're, since we brought it, since you brought up Medicaid kind of in relation to this, <clears throat> uh, how many, I, I don't even know the figure. I mean, maybe Ted Cruz talks about it or you might be aware of it because it's an issue that he has as a policy, but on average in the United States, how many abortions are carried out per year? Um, let's see. I had the figure in front of me. I don't have it now. I know since Roe v. Wade back in 1971, there's been over 50 million abortions in the United States. So if you want to divide that amongst uh, 30 plus 15, that's roughly... So about what? 2 million a year. About 2 million a year. Um, sorry, I don't have the fact. In front uh, no, of and, and that's fine because I'm just going to do really sloppy math. But Right. So, so, so we've that's, got... That's um, about 1,300 a day. Uh, I remember... Oh, okay. I remember doing the math a while back. It was about 1300 a day. Don't quote me on that. And that's fine. I, it's just really to make this point, again, in relation to Medicare and just cost in general. Um, and and it, this touches on a dark subject I don't think really gets brought up with abortion. But if you make abortion illegal and you've got now 2 million people that aren't getting aborted per day, um, you'll have a group of them that are going to have physical ailments. I mean, it'll probably be a small statistical amount. Right. But what Population you're going, explosion is what you're referring to. Right. But what else you're going to have is a lot of single mothers now with children they can't support. If we get rid of abortion because, let, let's say Ted Cruz is right. Let's say he's morally right that abortion is wrong. What is his stopgap method and what is his plan going forward? Because you're going to have a lot of people now that have a lot of kids. They weren't prepared to take care of. They probably can't financially support. So it's not just going to be Medicaid. It's going to be welfare. You're going to have all these single mothers that are going to want to collect checks. The $2 million a year is going to be a hell of a hit. So, I mean, how, how does society adjust to that when we have $2 million more people per year, every year, than what would have been there had abortion been legal? Right, right. Well, that, again, goes into his flat tax program because he does specifically address single mothers or single parents that happen to have children. And um, I, I think, if I remember correctly, part of it was his flat tax program, which is 10% uh, per person. I, I believe that's the, the income tax that they, they want to go with is 10%. Um, is essentially uh, subtracting the number of children you have uh, from a, a tax credit. If I can pull it up. Well, actually, um, while you pull that up, I, I wanted to bring this up. Um, the last time we did Meadowcast, <clears throat> sorry, last time we did Meadowcast, we brought up flat tax. And somebody left a comment, and I'll just read this really quick because it relates to that, and if you're going to talk about Ted Cruz's stance on it, because uh, we talked about Rand Paul's stance on it. Uh, this is from Alonzo Beckham, and I don't know how right he is, but it seemed to be a fairly, a fairly thought-out response, and he's just addressing uh, the flat tax. So I'm going to read that really quick. I'll give you a chance to pull up what you're going to pull up. Um, As an economics major who has taken time researching flat tax reform, I feel that Jim's guest did a horrible job representing it. Number one. First and foremost, or foremost, God, I'm tongue-tied here. First and foremost, most flat tax proposals include burning most of the current tax system to the ground. Apart from child credits and all that noise, most tax laws would be gone. Proponents argue this is a good thing because it makes the tax system more simple. You wouldn't have to spend a lot of time and money to get your taxes done. On average, money spent on completing taxes are billions annually. With that gone, the money could be used for more productive things. Point number two. Most flat tax reforms include a standard deduction, so if you're a single mother with children, there's a good chance that you would get the most uh, beneficial credits you had under the current tax system. This depends on different variations of the law, of course, but the good flat tax proposals have this included. Point number three. You don't necessarily have to lose money from a flat tax system. With the elimination of most tax codes, more income becomes taxable since a lot of exemptions and deductions are eliminated. To collect more revenue, politicians would either have to lower the standard deduction or raise the flat rate. And finally, point number four, that it will create jobs isn't that simple. Economic theory says it could happen in one of two, uh, if one of two things happen. Either it creates an incentive for workers to be more productive or it creates an incentive to invest more. Both could happen, both couldn't. I, I just wanted to bring that up because uh, he felt the, the last guest was misinformed and he wanted to, I guess, try to represent flat tax a little bit better. So ha right, having right. said that, um, why don't you tell us Ted Cruz's position on the flat tax and his ideas on it? Okay. Well, uh, in agreement with uh, whoever that economist major was, I'm I'm not um, I'm not an economic 
a genius or anything. I'm, I'm simply going off my personal knowledge and the experience that I've gained through it. Um, <clears throat> but he's right, you know, their single mothers will get tax deductions for having children. And that's the way the current system works with welfare as well. Um, but his, the, the way Ted Cruz wants to place his tax system is he wants to make it so simple, quote, that you can do taxes on a postcard and send it in. And, you know, that pretty much wants to get rid of all those tax services like H&R Block or Jackson Hewitt, as you would call it. Um, and just make it so simple that an average American can do their math on a postcard, send it into the government, and pay their taxes pretty simply. And, he, and whoever that was that you're just reading off of is right. You're going to be burning the uh, current system to the ground, and you're going to be starting from essentially scratch. Um, so the way Ted Cruz's tax system works is you have a personal income tax and you have a business flat tax. The personal income tax is 10%. Now, this gets rid of the estate tax, the alternative, alternate minimum tax, the net investment income tax, miscellaneous credits, payroll tax, uh, list goes on. And a family of four isn't going to pay taxes on the first $36,000 of income. That's directly from his website. Um, it exempts a large amount of uh, initial income for low and middle income taxpayers with a $10,000 standard deduction, uh, 4000 personal exemption, blah, 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 blah. <clears throat> and the plan keeps the charitable giving deductions and features a home mortgage in interest deduction capped at a principal value of $500,000. So basically for the average Joe, if you want to decipher what that is saying, he's trying to simplify the existing tax code, combine seven taxes into one, and like the business tax, he's trying to make it very similar to a VAT tax or a value-added tax, which is what they use in Europe. And when people hear VAT tax, which will transition into the business flat tax that he's proposing, um, some of them get scared. And I simply don't like the VAT tax that they have set up in Europe, but that's just how their system is. Um, for the business flat tax, it's a little bit different from the single rate 10% flat tax that Ted Cruz has for personal income. Uh, the business flat tax is 16%. Um, this is going to get a, a, a little, excuse me, this is going to get rid of a lot of uh, taxes for corporations um, such as the flat income, excuse me, where is the list? Well, let me ask you this while you're looking that up. Uh, okay, you, I, have, so, I have it right here. Oh, okay, um, go ahead. I, I wrote it down on a piece of paper because I can't keep all this organized. It gets, rid, it's, it gets rid of the payroll tax, the corporate income tax, the death tax, and the Obamacare tax that we all hear about. Okay, so we're talking about a 17% flat tax rate for corporations, businesses. Right. Um, what 16. is... Uh, I'm sorry, 16 That's right. Oh, okay, 16% uh, flat tax rate for corporations and businesses. Um what is his, does he address subsidies? I mean, if we're, if we're doing a flat tax, are we still doing, are we still subsidizing certain industries or is he pulling that back because now they're saving money? You know, I, I couldn't find any, any information on subsidizing companies. I would imagine as a Republican, he would back away somewhat from subsidizing companies that don't really have any need for being subsidized. Look at Solyndra, look at uh, GM, for example. Um, those were, that's two examples of companies that should not have been subsidized and should have been allowed to go under. Because in a capitalist economy, you can't just pick winners and losers and decide what company to subsidize because it wastes money and it, it wastes people's time. Um, but for companies that are trading internationally, and I, I know whoever it was on last hour was talking about companies trading internationally. I, I saw an interview a few days ago um, where he talked about his business flat tax of 16%. And he said, if you're competing internationally, obviously that tax can be adjusted lower, uh, particularly towards um, other industries or countries like China that are uh, importing goods into America and uh, have low tariffs on them. And low tariffs on China, you know, doesn't really uh, increase or um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? doesn't really increase an incentive for people to start producing in America. And that's why the business flat tax is so low, and that's why he said it could be adjustable. 
So he thinks, or one of the, the reasons that he's a proponent of a flat tax for companies is that he wants to try to kickstart or reinvigorate uh, the industrial base in America. He wants us to export more than we import like we used to. Exactly. Back when we were stronger, uh, right, comparatively right. to today. Um, okay. So it's 16% for the businesses. Uh, and then you said, what was the percentile for just your average everyday Joe? 10%. And I think I mentioned earlier, 10% could be um, an analogy for 10% uh, tithe or whatever you wanted to call it, but that's off topic. But uh, basically what's going to happen with this tax plan is it's going to reduce federal revenue by about $4 trillion over the next 10 years. It's a big number. The federal government only brings in so much money every year from taxes, and it's, uh, let's see, about $1.5 trillion if I'm correct, and I'm just going off of memory here. I haven't checked these figures in a while, and we spend a lot more than we bring in. So obviously, there's a there's a big deficit every year. Um, but the way he's going to make up for this four trillion dollar loss over the next decade is the incentive from the low business tax and the low personal income tax is going to lead to an increase. And this is based off of um, I think it was Tax Foundation's numbers: a 14 percent increase in GDP and a 13% um, increase in, in wages. And he hopes to add roughly 5 million new jobs and ultimately reduce tax revenues by about uh, $700 billion. So that $4 trillion is going to turn into uh, $700 billion is, is his hope. Now, we, we've seen examples of this in past elections where um, candidates might try to throw out this really... Uh, a glamorous kind of tax code that everybody can get behind. And it doesn't always work out. Herman Cain tried the 999 plan back in 2012. Well, Herman, and... Herman Cain might be clinically retarded, let's be honest. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm aware of his 999 plan and how right, right. ridiculous that was. Uh, just to, the just, 999 to a 666. Right. Just to talk about that, though, um, you said the total cost of savings or the uh, excess revenue they'd bring in was how, ma how many trillions? Well, no, there wouldn't be excess revenue. There would be a, a net loss in revenue of about $700 billion. Oh, okay, and so is that per year? Um, that was over, uh, let's see, 10 years? No, that I, I don't think that can be 10 years. I'd have to look at the figures again, and I'm sorry for the audience. No, that, no, and, and that's fine. Let, let's just, we can adjust the numbers later. But let's say it, it is over 10 years, so $7 billion a year. Um, you know, the average cost of living, I was looking this up kind of while you were talking, because I was curious back to that 2 million extra people per year. Right. Um, the average cost of uh, in America, according to open source ecology, is $20,000 to support a person per year in America, 20 grand. Right, right. If you have 2 million extra people because we've gotten rid of abortion, that's $40 billion of cost for food, clothing, housing, medical. So if you've got $40 billion and then you're losing $7 billion, Aren't you running a, a deficit of forty-seven billion, and that increases too because you have two million each year getting added on? Oh, absolutely. And not only that, uh, not only would you know the amount of money per person increase, but you have debt increase as well. And you know, if you look at the national debt, we're at about eighteen point eight trillion dollars and going up. Um, well, this kind of touches but, back on too of. Um, I think people want to feel, you know, if you're going to take away the right, uh, and this ties into the economic portion of this, but if you're going to take away somebody's right to be able to have an abortion, for, right. whatever, for whatever your reason is, you, you do have to have some kind of system in place to, uh, to basically address the excess amount of people and the cost they will, they will bring. Right, I'll, it, I'll get to that. It, Okay, and if it is $40 billion per year, uh, over a 10-year period, it's $400 billion, you add on the $70 billion that we're taking in less now. So where do we make up that shortfall of $470 billion? And, and that number is wrong, by the way. I mean, I'd have to add on $40 billion, and then next year it'd be another $40 billion, plus the previous $40 billion, you know what I mean? So yeah, it, it, we'd have to go to the power. Yeah, you get what I'm saying. But just roughly, you know, $470 billion, if there was only 2 million people excess born uh, during that decade rather than every year. So where is he making up the money for that? Right. Well, you know, we have a lot of programs in place right now, uh, primarily started when Barack Obama took office in 2008 and uh, whenever Bill Clinton had his presidency. Um, they, they put in a lot of systems, uh, social systems, I should say, that allowed for people to take in money without any reason to. Uh, for example, the welfare system we have now, it's very easy for somebody to abuse that. Um, it's very easy for somebody to abuse the social security system, uh, disability, the list goes on. 
And my thoughts are, and you know, I'm not quoting Ted Cruz here because I don't know exactly his plan. And you know, I, I should know his plan for how he's going to make up for this lost revenue, other than bringing in new jobs. I believe what he's going to do is uh, decrease the amount of funding that goes into these social programs and put them back into other programs. Um, say, for example, if there were a, a majority of, say, for example, if there were two million people that were not aborted. Uh, next year, um, I would think he would cut certain programs such as Social Security or Disability and put that into a fund that maybe would help those people. Now, like you said, this is hypothetical. Well, yeah, I'm not, I mean, I'm not really it, sure how to how to approach. No, this. and I and I understand. I mean, this is just a, a general conversation. But even with something like that, I mean, you're you're robbing right. Paul to it's pay Peter. Yeah, right. you're taking away from somebody who's already paid into the system and then giving it to somebody who's forced into it. Right. It's a flaw, and I, I acknowledge that to the listeners that you know this is a this is a flaw in Ted Cruz's tax plan, and that's why flat taxes don't always work. That's why you can't get rid of the IRS in one slash. I mean, that's what Ted Cruz wants to do is to essentially eliminate the IRS through simplifying the tax code. But, you know, we don't live in a perfect world. Flat taxes don't always work. Um, we've tried many different forms of tax systems in the past, um, and that's why the IRS was essentially brought into power back, uh, must have been the 1940s or 1930s when they first established the Internal Revenue Service. But... Anyway, um, well, okay, I'm not sure uh, if I can help you anymore on the tax. No, and, and that's fair. I mean, these are obviously questions you're not always going to have a ready answer for. That, that I think you've explained it uh, fair enough. You know what I mean? It, yeah. It's clear cut. So if people agree with it or if they have concerns about it, they're, they're pretty much decided at this point. Um, somebody in the chat asked this. And so, uh, again, a little fedora tipping for you. But ask uh, the Christ Cuck about Israel. What is, what is Ted Cruz's <laughs> stance on our relationship with Israel and peace in the Middle East? Well, uh, Ted Cruz's stance is, you know, he's behind Israel 100% as far as, as I've heard. Um, okay, I, I just pulled up the chat now because I haven't been looking at the Meadowcast. Now I got it paused, so I got it. Um, uh, Ted Cruz's stance on Israel is that we should continue to provide funding for them. And it, it, part of his plan is to decrease funding for countries that want to burn American flags. And you see examples of that in Iran. Just recently with the whole Iran nuclear deal, you know, we talked about, oh, we're going to be giving, uh, you know, billions of dollars to Iran because they're going to cut their, their uh, nuclear program. Well, we know that's not true, obviously. And yet the Ayatollah Khamenei continues to spew out propaganda against the United States and people continue to burn flags in the streets. And yet we just turn a blind eye to them and say, oh, well, let's not worry about that. Let's worry about... Uh, helping out the people here. We have to help the people in Iran. And if you're Palestinian and you're blowing up Jewish people, great for you. You know, heck with uh, Israel. They, they don't really matter at this point. But I, I think Ted Cruz's stance on Israel is very strong. Um, I'd have to pull up a video for you in order for you to, uh, to hear it. But uh, his stance on Israel is that we should continue to keep them as an ally because they are pretty much our only ally in the Middle East. Would he, uh, would he make them make amends for the USS Liberty? Um, you know, I'm, they, I'm they did sure. they did kill our sailors and sink our ship. Oh, are, are you talking about Iran make amends for No, the no, US? no, I'm talking about Israel. Israel killed oh, our right, sailors right, right. and sunk yeah. our ship. Would he make them answer for that? Well, that was quite a while ago. I'm not sure the exact year. When, when was that, 1970? I, I can't remember. It's 1967, but yeah. 1967, right. I, I'm asking because chat would probably want to, <laughs> chat would probably want to know in relation well, to that. I think any country that blows up one of our battleships or cruisers should make amends for that. Um, I'm sure they have made amends for that, uh, but honestly, I, I can't tell for... If, yeah. if I recall, Israel's official position on that was, oops. <laughs> um, I think that was their official fucking position on that was, oh, I'm sorry, we didn't see the American flags you had painted all over your fucking ship, and we didn't catch the broadcast where you said, what are you doing, we're Americans, stop shooting us. Oh, gosh, well, I know I shouldn't be laughing because Americans died, but uh, uh, when was it recently Iran managed to take hostage a, a cargo ship? I think it was, must have been August or September, Iran took a... Um, a cargo ship hostage and I'm pretty sure they still have the sailors aboard there uh, in prison right now 
and yet we still haven't negotiated for their release after this you know botched Iran nuclear deal. I, I think that's crazy that we should deal with a country that we know has terror ties and we know is funding uh, terrorist organizations. Turkey funds ISIS, and yet we still allow them to bomb the Kurds who uh, happen to be against ISIS. Um, I, I, you know, I'm not really sure exactly what we should do for amends, but... So he wants um, to disassociate our relations with nations that are openly hostile towards us, would be one way of putting it. Yes, that's one way of putting it, and yeah, I would agree that he would like to distance um, the United States from nations that want you know, to bring harm to the United States. How, how does that play into, um, I, I guess, our intervention or intercession in geopolitical events? So you have the situation in Syria. I mean, you brought up ISIS and kind of the uh, Turkey right, and right. Syria and all of this. So like with uh, Syria and ISIS, you have Russia going in there. Would he support Assad? Would he support Putin? Would he stay hands off on that? Would he let them work that out themselves? What would he do? Or has he spoken well, on this? Right. Assad and Putin are on the same page right now. And I think we're all aware of that, that Assad is working with Vladimir Putin to eliminate the Syrian rebels and eliminate any opposition. Ted Cruz's stance is that we should not topple dictators um, that are in power right now. And that does sound crazy. And, you know, I, I think certain dictators should be removed from power. But when you remove dictators from power, you're going to obviously have a power vacuum. Take a look at uh, Qaddafi, well, for didn't, example. Uh, didn't, I, I'm fairly certain, didn't Assad actually make a statement in relation to ISIS uh, after some of the more recent attacks saying, uh, how are the freedom fighters working out for you now? Because that, that, was, how the, <laughs> that, that was how the Western press painted them. Um, yeah, well, um, I, I mean, Assad is not a good person by any means. Um, I'm sure Assad has gassed his people. What I find ironic is that Barack Obama, if you remember correctly, uh, must have been earlier 2015, he said we are going to draw a red line in the sand, and if Assad crosses this, then uh, it's, it's no good. And they were supporting Assad for a majority of the time. And, you know, the United States did support Assad for quite a while until they decided to get rid of him for reasons I don't know. I don't know why they got rid of Assad. I don't know why they backed the Syrian rebels who um, are excuse me, Syrian rebels who are trying to get rid of Assad, but that's just their plan. And back to the red line thing, Barack Obama said, if Assad gasses his people, then we're going to take action. Well, they did gas the people, um, and a lot of people died in the process. I don't know the exact number. And Barack Obama made no statement afterwards saying, okay, we're, we're going into Syria now to fix this problem. He just sort of brushed it off. And, you know, you'll hear Republicans talking about, okay, red line in the sand, whatever, that's not going to work. Ted so Cruz's, what, uh, okay, what would Ted Cruz, uh, what would his relationship with Iran look like? I mean, we've, we've had an American administration that uh, years prior basically used Stutnex to try to dismantle their nuclear program. And right. now he's gone to the negotiating table and said, okay, well, maybe we'll let you have nuclear power. So would he go back to the you know, uh, we don't want Iran to have nuclear power, or would he stick with the current course of, yeah, let them develop their program? Okay. I, all right. I see here uh, in the chat somebody said uh, Assad didn't gas his people. That may be true. It could have been the Syrian rebels who gassed people just to uh, get the international community's attention. But um, yeah, back to your question um, dismantling Iran's uh, nuclear program. Uh, Ted Cruz has stated devoutly that he's going to get rid of the, the current deal that we have with Iran. Um, who just said nuclear? Okay, somebody in the chat said nuclear. It's nuclear. Um, oh, you got to remember, I'm a Minnesota boy, so... Oh, okay. I, I say hyperbole, like it's a fucking sporting event in the future, <laughs> so they're going to have to deal with that. All right, okay. anyway, go, go ahead. All right, well, uh, anyway... Um, Ted Cruz's stance on Iran and their nuclear program is that uh, you know we, we shouldn't allow terrorists to build up nuclear arsenals. And we, we know they have a nuclear arsenal right now. We know they have missiles that are ready to launch a nuclear warhead if necessary. Um, it's the same way with uh, you know North Korea right now. But uh, back on topic, uh, relationship with Iran, I don't think we're going to have that good of a relationship with them, and I don't think we'll continue to if Ted Cruz becomes president. And I think it's the same way with Donald Trump as well. I don't think anybody on the Republican side really likes Iran and what they're planning, because their stated goal is to get rid of Israel, to bomb Israel, and to get rid of the great Satan, the United States. Um, 
I, well, I mean, let, let me bring up this point. I mean, we're, we're t so we're talking about Iran as a hostile power that exists out there. Uh, maybe not openly hostile, but they definitely have their issues with the West and America. Oh, they're uh, definitely open, openly hostile, too. Uh, okay, so they, they want to, Ted Cruz wants to pull back. Um, he doesn't want to give them this deal. He doesn't want them to have nuclear power, nuclear arms. Remove aid from Iran, place sanctions on them. Uh, okay, what would he do with Pakistan then? I mean, we've got a nation that's already... Uh, armed with nuclear weapons. I mean, Osama bin Laden was hiding out there. You've got terror cells operating out of there. Would he do something with them then, too? I mean, is he going to go around to nations that already are nuclear uh, equipped with nuclear weapons and do something? Or is he just dealing with the people that are up and coming? I don't think that Ted Cruz is going to do something to the nations that already have nuclear weapons. You don't really mess with nations that have nuclear weapons and try to take them away. Um, if you, you remember back to when Gaddafi was still in power, before he was gaddafi in the butt and died, um, Gaddafi did have a nuclear program, and he did have a system set in place in which he could acquire nuclear weapons. Anybody can acquire nuclear weapons. And the United States pretty much bullied Gaddafi into getting rid of his nuclear weapons program, and I think rightly so they did. And uh, eventually Gaddafi... Um, you know, started cooperating with the United States. And that's what he did up until the time of his death. He cooperated with the USA and he was essential to taking out radical Islamic terrorists in the Middle East. Okay, but, um, uh, let me interrupt just one more time, then we'll get back on topic here. Uh, people in the chat wanted me to check Twitter. Uh, this question would be directed at you uh, in relation okay. to Ted Cruz's uh, international relations and money management. Okay, um, this is not my strongest point, so uh, the, and, my strongest area. So I apologize to the viewers. Uh, Bane posting wants to know: Ask him what he thinks about the USA taking debts by China and giving it then to Iran for free, or I'm sorry, Israel for free. Um, I don't really know anything about that. I'm I'm sorry. Um, okay, uh, and then but, Rudolph. Repeat the question one more time. Uh, yep, Bain Posting asked, ask him what he thinks about the United States of America taking debts from China, and, or taking jets, or debts by China, and giving it then to Israel for free. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm drawing a blank here, I don't know. Okay, and then the other comment from Rudolf Haas was, he wanted me to call you a cuck, so... Okay, well, go, go ahead. Okay, you're, you're a cuck. Uh, thank you, okay. All right, so, so we've talked about his flat uh, tax plan, we've talked about his stance on abortion... We've talked about international relations and him wanting to kind of step back from the Iran deal. Um, what other uh, planks in his platform would he be well known for, or what should people know about him? What, what would you like to discuss next? Well, um, I know we're short for time, but I'll try to wrap this up as best as I can. Um, the reason why I like Ted Cruz a lot is because he completely denounces the media and what they stand for. And anybody who the media attacks, in my opinion, uh, for attacking them is a hero in my books because uh, you'll hear Lindsey Graham, Rhino, and John McCain talking about oh how evil Donald Trump is and um, how he needs to stop. But honestly, if if Lindsey Graham doesn't like somebody, then I most likely like that person. Um, but back on topic, uh, Ted Cruz does not like the media. He doesn't like the direction the media has turned. Um, another plank in his plan, uh, he believes that you know gun rights are central to the Constitution that by taking away the Second Amendment, um, you allow for other amendments to be repealed. And, you know, it, some things that could refer to taking away Second Amendment rights wouldn't be simply taking away guns, but it could refer to taxes or, um, you know, taxes or limits on ammunition, on certain rifles, banning certain assault weapons, uh, magazines in particular. Um, I, in my opinion, I think if you want to own an Abrams tank, you should be able to. Now, is that, is that your opinion, or Ted, has Ted Cruz said, if you want to own a tank, drive it down Main Street, I'm okay with that? That's what I've uh, particularly drawn from what Ted Cruz has said. You might hear that from Ron or Rand Paul, that um, you, if you want an Abrams tank, you should be able to drive it. That's my personal opinion. But um, he, he doesn't think that you know, placing restrictions on the Second Amendment is good. Um, not because the NRA is telling him to say that, but because if you believe in the Constitution and you believe that this document has survived for 250 years and will continue to survive without getting rid of the Second Amendment, then you have to protect the rest of the amendments. Okay, okay. Um, you know, I want to finish this up because uh, we are kind of getting to the end of this um, with a, a question that I've been kind of curious about or something I've been curious about in relation to Ted Cruz. Uh, during, one of the, uh, during the last debate between uh, the Republican candidates, uh, it was pretty apparent 
that they wanted to try to get Trump and Cruz to go after one another. Now, Trump didn't, and neither did Cruz, and they kind of had a, a bonding moment up there. Do you, do you think, and the reason I bring this up is because Jeb Bush has hinted that uh, Donald Trump will not get the Republican nomination as if he has some sway with the delegates, you know what I mean? Like he's going to make sure some, through some kind of backroom dealings that Trump doesn't get it. So oh, do, you, do, you, oh, okay. do you think that Ted Cruz and Donald Trump were buddy-buddy in that moment because they both have a disdain for the media and the smear job they try to do? Or do you think that it's an indicator that somewhere down the road, Cruz would be a VP candidate with Trump, and that's how he's going to secure that nomination and basically screw over somebody like Jeb Bush who thinks he can do backroom dealings? Well, I, I've heard from a lot of people saying that it'd be horrible if we had Ted Cruz as vice president. Um, honestly, I don't think it's that bad of an idea. Um, in regards to do I think that Ted Cruz likes Donald Trump because of um, – because they want to team up against Jeb Bush. Um, I really don't know. I have uh, transcripts here of Ted Cruz saying he thinks Don, uh, Donald Trump is a good candidate and he doesn't want to attack Donald Trump because the media is already doing that. Um, I just sent you a link uh, from the CNBC uh, debate. If you want to play that for just a second, I, I got a big kick out of this. This is why I'm, I'm, I'm backing uh, Ted Cruz right now. But just to be clear, this early in the primary, I don't think anybody can really back a presidential candidate. And that's why I try to steer clear of backing presidential candidates um, early in the primary. I, I think I remember this. It wasn't just Cruz either. I think they all went off on the CNBC moderators. Oh, but, yeah. Um, Huckabee did and a few other people. Yeah, Chris Christie ran. I mean, everybody got a good jab in, but Cruz definitely took the uh, lead in this. Yeah, I'll, I'll play this for the audience here. One second. Okay. This is not a cage match. And you look at the questions, Donald Trump, are you a comic book villain? Ben Carson, can you do math? John Kasich, will you insult two people over here? Marco Rubio, why don't you resign? Jeb Bush, why have your numbers fallen? How about talking about the substantive issues people care about? Does, does this count? Does this, do, I, do we get credit for this one? And, and Carl, Carl, I'm not finished yet. The contrast with the Democratic debate where every fawning question from the media was, which of you is more handsome and wise? <laughs> so this is and a let question me be about clear. the dead limit, which you, you have 30 seconds left to answer, should you choose to do so. <coughs> let me be clear. The men and women on this stage have more ideas, more experience, more common sense than every participant in the Democratic debate. That debate reflected a debate between the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks. <laughs> And nobody watching at home believes that any of the moderators has any intention of voting in a Republican primary. The questions that are being asked shouldn't be trying to get people to tear into each other. It should be, what are your substantive okay, solutions okay. to people who are I just want the record to reflect. Guys, I asked you about the dead limit, and on. I got no answer. I, okay, all right, you, on, want, you want me to answer that question? Well, I'm happy to answer the question. I'm happy time. to answer Our the question, but let me tell you how the question is. Let me tell you how that question is. We're moving on. Let me tell you how that question is. Senator Paul, I've got a question for you on the same subject. So you don't actually want to hear the answer, John? Senator Paul. You don't want to hear the answer. You just want to just look insult. You used your time on something else. Senator Paul. You're not interested in an answer. John, I'm interested in an answer from Senator Paul. Senator Paul, the yeah, I, I remember this uh, uh, debate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I remember the uh, CNBC was really uh, pretty terrible about how they hosted this. And I think uh, the majority of the people up on stage disliked it. But Ted Cruz really shined through uh, with his condemnation of mm -hmm. how they were trying to play one person off the other rather than address anything substantive. Yeah, They didn't want to talk about taxes. They didn't want to talk about national defense. They didn't want to talk about that. They wanted some kind of a television drama, like a soap right, opera. They they wanted to have a bunch of dogs fighting each other and biting at each other's necks. Right, correct. All right, well, I'm going to, we'll close up the segment. I'll give you a couple minutes here. Is there anything else you want to tell them? Why should they vote for Ted Cruz? What should they well, do? Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and say this. If you know, I'm not going to, you know, tell people you should vote for Ted Cruz because he's an evangelical Christian. I'm not going to tell you you should vote for him because he's right or wrong. Um, in my opinion, um, I'm right now torn between Donald Trump and Ted Cruz. And I'm not saying that because I'm an uneducated, low-information voter. I'm saying that because I'm simply fed up with the system that we have in place right now. Um, the political system is very corrupt. And the political system that we have in place right now 
feeds off of the media and the media's ability to um, persuade the people how bad America is. And um, I, I just can't stand him for that reason. Um, Ted Cruz is a man that has stood behind the Constitution, and his voting record proves that. And Ted Cruz thinks that America's um, safety should come first, unlike Democrats and Republicans, Jeb Bush, for example, who believe in an open border system and a lax vetting system. And um, I, I can't agree with anything Jeb Bush has to say. Um, and I, you know, I, I like Donald Trump and I like the stance he has taken. I don't know if I'm going to vote for him yet and I'm not going to say that yet or Ted Cruz yet. Um, but right now, those are my, those are my two candidates. Um, I wish we had a little bit more time. I would have liked to condemn Bernie Sanders. I had a little story I'd like to tell the audience if you had a moment. Uh, yeah, if you want to take a few moments here and uh, finish up with a, a Sanders story. And uh, as far as Jeb Bush, I don't think even he believes what he says. <laughs> he, he, you know, he's he's the most depressing candidate I've ever seen in my life. And I really do mean it. I think he's going to probably be found hanging in a closet or something uh, by poor, March. Poor Jeb, poor Jeb. Poor, His, poor Jeb, yeah. Jeb's mistake started when Donald Trump first talked about who's doing the raping. Jeb Bush immediately condemned him. And from that point on, Jeb Bush felt obligated to continue to condemn Donald Trump. And I don't think he understood. And the chat says, can you even vote? I will in 30 days. I don't think Jeb Bush understood that when you continue to condemn somebody who has a large majority of the Republican base behind him, you're not going to get more votes because of that. You're especially Donald Trump. It's just going to ruin you completely. And uh, Jeb Bush can't seem to figure that out. And that's the reason why Ted Cruz is somewhat high in the polls and is number two behind Donald Trump is because he hasn't specifically condemned Donald Trump or condemned anything he said. He said he may disagree with them, but he's not going out there and actively disagreeing with Donald Trump. Um, which is a which is a fair point. Um, all right, well, let, let's move on to the Sanders story. I'll let you finish up. Well, actually, before we do that, just so they know, if they wanted to follow Ted Cruz or find out more about his policies or get in touch with him, what would be the best means of doing that? Where can they become the most informed about his stances, and how would they contact him? Um, well, I, I subscribe to his email system. That's just about it. All I get are emails asking for money, but um, I'm sure you could check Twitter. I know he's very active on Facebook. Um, definitely check Facebook if you want to get more info from him there. Um, other than that, I go to Ted Cruz events. I go to Donald Trump rallies. There was one here on Hilton Head a while back that I went to um, about two or three months ago, and there was one uh, on Wednesday that I actually went to, and that was that was exciting. But I see people are asking for the Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, story. so it's that, not that it's not really that big of a story. It well, and that that that's fine. So if you're interested, social media, Facebook, Twitter, his email system, if you want more info. So close us out. Close us okay. out with your your Sanders story. Well, so I have a few liberal friends in high school. I have one SJW as a friend. Um, used to be conservative, for some reason has converted to SJWism. Um, they really like. Uh, Bernie Sanders. And I really like Ted Cruz. So I invited him to a Ted Cruz event. They went along just for laughs. Um, and then I found out that Bernie Sanders was coming to South Carolina. So I told them and I said, hey, you guys want to go with me? They said, sure. It was a Sunday afternoon. So me being the, the Christ cuck I am, the evangelical Christian, I show up in my suit and tie and they happen to have suit and ties as well. Um, well, none of Bernie's supporters had on suit and ties uh, they look like they just crawled out of an Occupy Wall Street protest and made their way to the, the building. It's a small little shack out in the middle of the woods, essentially. So the three of us show up in our suit and ties. Everybody else is dressed horribly. Um, immediately, one of the two staffers pointed us out and said, you three, come with me. So now I'm a, I'm a conservative with my liberal friends. He put us in charge of ushering people into the building, making sure everything's okay. And, you know, I just showed up five minutes ago. So after that, the head campaign manager uh, for Bernie Sanders, campaign manager for Bernie Sanders in South Carolina, comes up to me and my friend and says, I need you to, to uh, come out back. The senator is going to be showing up very shortly. I need you to keep the crowd tight. So I thought about that for a second. I said, well... He wants us to keep the crowd tight. Surely Bernie Sanders has some sort of form of security, some sort of secret service because he is, he, you know, he's a senator. Surely he has something to help protect him. Nope. 
he pulls up in a blue minivan because his bus broke down a while back and he gets out of the front seat. And I'm, like I said, I'm 17 years old and my friend is also 17 years old. We're two kids. We're pushing back Bernie Sanders supporters with um, cameras and everything and trying to keep people away from Bernie Sanders. And we, we did this for about three hours. He got up on stage. We had to keep people back. And we were essentially Bernie Sanders' bodyguards for roughly three hours, I should say. And the ironic thing about the ironic thing about it is, you know, I'm probably his, I probably was his number one enemy at that event, and yet I was three feet away from him. Opportunity missed or whatever, but um, I, I just thought that was really interesting. The the whole time we had to guard his doors and make sure nobody tried to attack him or whatever, and. Uh, it, you know, if you show up to a Bernie Sanders event in a suit and a tie, people are going to take you seriously. And it doesn't matter if you have credentials or not. All you have to do is stare down whoever his supporters are, and they'll bow down to you because you're wearing a suit. But I just found that completely h- hilarious that um, the, the campaign managers didn't even figure out who the heck we were or, um, you know, who I was to begin with. I well, see, that, that, that story is funny for two reasons. One, that Sanders would want free shit from the people you know, <laughs> attending his own event. But two, and I'm sure Chat's going to agree with me on this, um, you kind of got cucked a little bit. You, you went to a Bernie Sanders event and did free security <laughs> for him for three hours. I'm amazed you didn't just jump on stage and take a shit there. You know what I mean? Like, just defecate. Well, you know, <laughs> that, was, that was my plan, because I told one of my friends before we got up there, I said, hey, you know, we could pretend to be uh, Black Lives Matter protesters and we can get up there and take his microphone and he won't do anything about it. But, you know, when you're dressed in a suit and when you have campaign managers asking you to do this job, you sort of feel a sense of duty to protect whoever it is. Um, Yeah, I did kind of get cucked up there, but um, I enjoyed myself and uh, I had a lot of fun pretending to be, um, you know, a wolf in sheep's clothing. I was... Well, wait a minute. What if they had mistake, mistaken you for the janitor? Would you unclog his toilets for three hours? <laughs> no. It, listen, if somebody had a knife or a gun and tried to attack Bernie Sanders, believe me, I probably would have turned around and walked back to my car and gotten in because I wasn't getting paid for anything. All right. Well, I, I <laughs> it's an entertaining story, but I thank you for coming out. Um, having you on to do your, your pitch of candidate. Uh, I'll try to get you back on uh, if you want to really go into Sanders. I, I know you said you wanted to condemn him a little bit. Maybe, oh, sure. Maybe... Absolutely. Love to do that. Okay. All right. Well, uh, again, appreciate you coming out and uh, you have a good one. Thanks, Jim. Have a good day. All right. Bye. Okay. Well, that's going to close out the uh, the Metocast for today. Uh, just so you know, on the 9th, so the next Saturday, uh, format is a little bit different. Every fourth episode is basically a free-for-all. So if you want to say something, if you want to bring something up, if you want to discuss a topic, hopefully related to politics, uh, you can come on. I'll have a system set up in the middle of the week, and we'll find out a way to make it work. And I'll basically bring you on, and we'll discuss whatever you want for about 10, 15 minutes. I'll try to give everybody a fair amount of time. If it's really entertaining, I'll let you go longer than that. If it's just god-awful, I'm going to cut you off short. So if you're coming, make sure it's good, is is what I'm telling you. And then we'll be back to, to the normal format after the 9th, uh, where I'll have more people coming on to condemn and to pitch a candidate, and we'll cover cover the local news. Uh, I'll take a look real quick one last time at the Meadowcast tag here, see if anybody had anything they wanted to say, and then I'm going to close it out. Uh, Christ Cuck's story is fake and gay. You know, I don't know. Bernie Sanders, he wants free shit for everybody, so it wouldn't really surprise me that he would just pick a random person that is clean cut in his hippie audience and be like, you're going to work security for me. Now, shine my shoes, I'm Bernie Sanders. I could kind of see that happening. Uh, what is this? Bernie Sanders loves free shit so much that he'll make a 17-year-old guard him for free. That really about sums it up. That that sums up his political stance. All right, well, uh, thank you, everybody, for coming out. Again, next week, I'll, ha- I'll have the system set up, so if you're interested, just check Twitter, and there'll be some kind of mechanism to get you on. <laughs>